and for s we should have sound on YouTube now. For some reason, my sound is uh, uh, like sh it tur I turn it on, and then it turns off all automatically on its own when I start the stream. But uh, we um, we're going to talk about something really interesting today. We're going to talk about uh, this book a little bit, Golder Etcher Bach, and we're going to. Um, uh, which I have not gone through with any kind of like, um, you know, serious study. But I I have seen things that look familiar, and I put little like uh, pieces of paper in there to uh, to just you know look at later. But we're going to take a look at it. We're also going to talk about the Fibonacci sequence. We're going to talk about. Uh, spin sequences and spinners and basically just um, you know growth the concept of growth what is growth we're gonna look at some spin sequences in my uh, work and uh, we're going to take a look at why the multiverse chain is an eternal golden braid so uh, it's, it's interesting that this book, Eternal Golden Braid, it's gold implies eternity anyways. It's almost like redundant. But, uh, like, should have just gone with Golden Braid. But uh, we'll talk about it. How's, you, how's YouTube doing, Chris? Is here? Awesome. Uh, it says no data. Hopefully you start to get some data. We'll see. I don't know. It's weird sometimes on YouTube. It's myster mysterious. But uh, let me pull up my work here. We're going to look at some spin sequences. But yeah, last night was a, was a, a fun stream. We talked about um, the square root. And we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight. Um, and how the square root is, as Eric Weinstein puts it, the psychedelic of mathematics. Um, some, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't want to like push anything too forward too quickly, but I, like I said, I am in some talks with some people to go on some other channels, um, and discuss some of this work. So I've been, um, making progress on that. So that's another thing that's going on. But I will update you guys. If I'm ever going to go live on anyone else's channel, uh, I mean, I will. But when I do, I will definitely let everybody know. So let's take a look at some uh, eternal golden braids. Open recent. Think of everyone, guys. I have so much work. This guy on the Discord last night, uh, or this mor early this morning, I had posted some of my work that we had talked about. Like uh, one of the Discords, I'm part of a few Discords. Some of them are very, they really are interested in the work. They really find it fascinating, and the others, um, ironically, it's always Eric Weinstein's Discord. They are as I've told you, just fun in their, like, their reaction is at this point just, it's just funny. But um, I, I posted something and I was like, you know, you know, look at how these, all these structures form to squares. It's like the square root really is the, the, the root. And somebody was like, uh, I, I was like, all my mom, they, were, they said, well, quantum mechanics is, um, is the framework for um, uh, mathematics and physics. And I was like, yeah, I know, but there's, you know, obviously a framework that leads to the framework of the standard model. And my models line up with the standard model. And they were like, you don't have models. I was like, model. And I like posted a model. And then I was like, model. And I posted another model. It is, 
it is so odd. Like, I really, and the reason why I talk about this, it's not because it bothers me, it gets to me. It's interesting. For a stream that's about consciousness, to see people behave so unconsciously and to literally pull wool over their eyes just because of something is is not jiving with their internal narrative of some in some way it it's a mechanical process that's taking place it's not um uh it's i'm not like complaining like this is it is fascinating when people are in cognitive dissonance like it is it is fascinating it is a mechanical process taking place something is not jiving with your nar internal narrative and it really does um uh, uh, like, you know, I don't know, it screws up your co coherence, your coherence, I guess. But, uh, got a stream and audio is good. Thank you for letting me know, Chris. Got to hop off for a bit. We'll be back soon. Cool. Um, but, uh, let's see here. Uh, I wanted to show you guys some of the work that I'm doing with spin sequences with hold on one second sorry okay regarding spin sequences so Let's make sure that this looks nice for the people on Instagram. Uh, if you are on Instagram, I if you want to check it out on YouTube, it's always better audio and also better um, video. But you know, sometimes it's easy to just you know be on uh, Instagram as well. So, but what I wanted to look at is this sequence of numbers that I found. And we're kind of, I haven't looked at it in a long time. Uh, and I found it when I was, um, when I was just messing with Fibonacci sequence a lot. And I had actually had this book, Golder Etcher Bach, and An Eternal Golden Braid, it's called. And I didn't really realize its relevance to anything that I was doing because a friend had just gifted it to me and I'd like looked at it and I was like, oh, interesting. This is definitely on a lot of the work that I do. And then I put it away. Um, and I don't, cause I don't really like to look at other people's work um, very much cause this project comes from first principles. But uh, I was looking at spin sequences and I had come up with this one. And this one to me is completely fascinating because it starts with one, then it goes to two, and then it goes to one again, which together is four, okay? So it's a triality resulting in, a, 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 in its count, resulting in a, a sum of four, and it's almost like also a binary because you've got one and then one and it's reflect they're both reflecting across this two in the center but then after that the spin sequence just kicks off into point four 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 you know repeating and then it's point one eight five one eight five one eight five one eight five then it's point zero seven four zero seven four zero seven four zero seven four and then it just kind of like breaks down a bit um in what we're able to see but uh, what you can see is that it's forming a braid. As I move this, you can literally see that this spin sequence is forming this spinning braided structure. And you can see this in all kinds of spin sequences, including the Fibonacci sequence. So if we're going to look at like, um, you know, right here, where I'm just kind of examining all kinds of growth sequences. There's lots of uh, lots of work on this document, but you can see that spinning 
in basically any um, sequence that we pick. So if and it's easier to see as you kind of like go scroll down a little bit, but some of them are much easier to see than others like that one that I showed you. But um, e each of these spin sequences that I've uh, been messing with are originally coming from just taking the Fibonacci sequence, taking the count of numbers, you know, just one, two, three, four, five, you know, continuously, and the Lucas numbers, and just kind of seeing what happens when we divide them by each other or multiply them by each other and see what kind of structures we end up getting and uh, quantities that we end up getting. But when I was... What was so interesting about this this one sequence that um, is the one that I showed you guys um, uh, before that I just call the gold the Goldstein sequence for now is that it very much lines up with creation of the universe and you can see that in how like I said it starts with one then it goes to two then it goes to one again together they are four in a triality but also having a binary nature and then it just kicks off within itself um, when you cross over a decimal, it's basically like running the system inside of itself is, is kind of what I see. Is like it's anything on the left side of the decimal is on one level, and then anything on the other side is kind of internal. It's like if this side of the decimal is what you are, basically, on this side of the decimal is what you are perceiving in your mind. So what's happening is, is that there is this quadru quadratic system, I guess, of four that's formed. And then it's running the system within itself. And that's why you're getting this infinitely repeating four. It, it's, it is infinitely repeating. It's just Excel has a limit on the amount of um, you know, decimals that you can get. But like I said, it's very much obviously creating this, this gorgeous spiral. And when I was examining this, what I found was that, and I need to see if I can find it again. I know I have it um, on this document, but past a certain point uh, where order starts to have the perception of breaking down, which it's not breaking down, but it's just having the perception of breaking down. Um, when, you, when I was summing it, I was getting 33 which lines up perfectly with the idea that I stated in my creation model that God essentially put 33% of his energy into creation. And, um, and that is a logical inevitability. It's because you need that in order to fit inside of yourself, essentially, and he can only divide himself by quanta whole numbers because he is a whole number he is one so you he can try dividing himself by one but that doesn't result in what you need which is multiplicity and stable multiplicity uh, because he gives all of his energy to creation and he has none left over so you're still left with oneness and if there's no multiplicity there's no meaning if he does uh, divides himself by two he's the same size as creation that means he can't sustain creation it's not stable um, but if he divides himself by three and puts one third of his energy into creation, now we've got the stable structure where it fit, it basically like fits inside of him, but it's it's not really. I mean, it is it is that I mean essentially, but it's 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 that it fits inside of him, and the amount of energy necessary to run creation is less than the amount of energy that he has left over for himself, uh, you know, significantly. So he can. It's like putting your mask on first when you're on an airplane. They're like, please put your fast mask on first before you assist little children. God has to put his mask on first. 33% to create universe. Yes. Um, are numbers even real or just a projection of our minds? They're both. They're real and projection of mind. But not just our mind, but the mind. But... Uh, 30, we'll take a look at this 33% real quick, and then we'll come back to the sequence to show you the context of this sequence. But uh, when we look at 
kind of my visual summary here. This right here is a creation model. And you can see that here, this is like the labels. Um, and then he, these are the various descriptions of what's going on in these various, you know, actions. And you start with one, which, you know, the sum here is one, but it's also quadratic. It's a square root. And it, this represents inside, outside, separate, and oneness as the four primary perspectives of, um, of uh, you know, the sentient singularity of God. And when you divide this by three, um, you get that stable structure that I was talking about. But you can see here, this is all equations that are calculating to return whether or not it says true or it says, says false. And uh, basically what's happening is that it will return true if the value of creation is less than, cre than what is left over from the division. So like here, you, this is not working, which is division by one. This one is not working in division by two. This one division by three, you get a stable structure and it returns true on the third action. And um, you can see that it's just basically creating this symmetry structure. And for anybody who can't see what's going on, and this is all emergent. None of this was tried to get. Like, I don't try to get these quantities. They are all emergent. It's very important that that's the way that things are. Um, for some reason, I can't make this smaller. OK. There we go. OK, so what you can see is that the average here is one and one third. And what's interesting about this is that when essentially, essentially God divides his energy and creates creation, as much as we think about it as, okay, he's got 66% of his energy left over for him, two thirds, and he puts one third of his energy towards creation, beca because he's still all powerful over creation, it's almost like he didn't, it doesn't matter whether or not he has 66.666% of his energy left over or whether or not he has 100% of his energy left over because he's still 100% sovereign over creation. So from one perspective, it might look like it's two thirds here and one third, two thirds for God, one third for creation. But from the perspective of creation, what it is, is it's one and one third because he didn't lose himself okay he's still sovereign so he's still one and what you can see is interestingly the average is one and one third and uh we can even see this like more so when we add the quantum of consciousness which is basically all matter to the creation model and we see that this is a triality. This is one and two and three, but it's really one, which is creator, and creation reflecting across an intrinsic constraint, which is the logic of the system and the constraints of the system. But when we sum even all three of these, I don't know if you can see this, but the average is still one and one third. The count is 21, the sum is 28. You know, very interesting as well, but it, this, this average of one and one third is very important. And it is what I am going to uh, show you regarding the spin sequence that I found. And I think that it's, I think that the sequence that I found is profound. Uh, and like I said, right now I'm just calling it like the Goldstone sequence or Goldstein sequence, whatever you want to call it. I don't, it's not for my own, you know, uh, self-aggrandizing or anything like that. It's just that it's like gold or Etrebach. It's an eternal golden braid. If this sequence represents creation objectively, more so than even the Fibonacci sequence, which is creation subjectively, and uh, then basically 
it's it is the structure of the e the eternal braid essentially so like it's it makes sense to call it like the gold stone sequence gold represents eternity stone represents like rock the or the origin you know the base the foundation so it's like the eternal foundation sequence you could call it that too but every the lucas numbers are a name the fibonacci numbers are a name you know so whatever it's fine but um but this is very interesting because it just it shows the constraints that the rest of the universe has to abide by as creation unfolds emergently, completely. This entire structure is emergent. It's not, um, you know, there's very little freedom in how to make the universe. There's just complete freedom in whether or not to make the universe. To make the universe went against God's nature. God's nature is oneness. Mul to create multiplicity is against his nature because his nature is inherently oneness like the nature of existence is that it is inherently one that's just a fact it's a logical inevitability that means that the system that gave rise to the creation of multiplicity with within you know existence which is multiplicity of consciousness would have to go against the nature of the creator of the system itself it was a free will choice so but then how the universe unfolds after that, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, the structure of it at least, it's entirely deterministic, which is fascinating. So it's like, it's a superposition between free will and determinism. I, I talked about this yesterday. People who have these st stupid debates um, of free will versus determinism, they're it's just a stupid debate. It's, it, they require each other, but we contextualize them in relativity, and what that does is it makes everything seem opposing instead of complementary and, and necessitating each other. So, like, uh, you know, like, uh, I actually, funny enough, I, made, I started making this yesterday. We can talk about it a bit, but I'm going to do it, uh, uh, like, its own... Um, a, its own what's it called episode on this but I started assembling stupid questions they say oh there's no stupid questions there's definitely stupid questions guys but they're not stupid for the reasons that you think they're stupid they're stupid because of actually like I'm looking where I put it but um, there's actually something fascinating about um about them that is that shows that the the question structure itself is wrong. So, like asking, where did life begin? When did life begin? This is one of those questions on the list. Life never didn't exist. There's only life that exists. There's no such thing. Death inherently cannot exist. Like maybe it can, but it once you're dead, then you don't exist. So, like the dead don't even exist. It's just I'm not saying there isn't an afterlife. There is. There is an afterlife, as, but it's just, it's not even an afterlife. It's just the next phase of life. It's you being saved into the, um, the, the static aspect of the system. So, like, essentially, if space-time is, like, the desktop where things can move and change and you can, you know, manipulate things, that is the change space. The hard drive where you're saving things is the heavens, and there is a place where, like, um, that is the eternal place of the soul, and it does exist. It's, you know, so I'm not saying there isn't an afterlife. But this idea of, like, where did life begin? It's like, atoms are alive. Molecules are alive. Hadrons are alive. They're not not alive. They are definitely alive. And I can prove it. I've talked about it. Um, and... Uh, you know, you can use the structures that I have outlined to make predictions in those systems that are very much uh, consistent with living, what we call currently living organisms. It's, it's all a living organism. You're inside a living organism. You are a living organism. You're made up of more living organisms. Um, but let's see if I can find that. Uh, stupid questions but one of them is free will de and determinism the other one is when did life begin the other one um, is like you know 
Okay, here they are. Bad questions. Free will versus determinism. Flat Earth versus round Earth. This is also another stupid question. Is it flat? Is it round? Guys, if you're so focused on the shape of the Earth as an objective structure, then you have not realized the reality of material, of the material universe. The true matter is what matters, and what matters is consciousness. That's it. So you determine the shape of the Earth. And remember, everything falls objectively into one of these four perspectives of inside, outside, separate, and oneness. These are the four primary perspectives. It's not on Earth. It's in Earth. Are you inside Earth? Are you outside Earth? If you're inside Earth, it looks flat. If you're outside it, it looks round. This is true of many structures, not just planets. And, um, but it looks like a sphere uh, from the outside. But the, the reality is this doesn't have an objective shape. That's the truth then it renders this entire debate just, it's a stupid debate. It is flat when you're inside it, to you. It is a sphere when you're outside it, to you. And, um, you know, or if you're trying to perceive it from the outside, whether or not that's even through mathematics on the ground where you're, you know, measuring shadows and obelisks and things like that, like, it's still, you're still trying to perceive it from outside even though you're inside so it's it's gonna you're gonna be able to manifest a sphere when you're looking for a sphere you're gonna be able to manifest flatness when you're looking for flatness but it has to do with whether or not you're inside it or outside it there's a stupid question but i actually love the whole flat earth phenomenon because i think that it's causing people to try and think for themselves as opposed to just taking you know an authority at its word and I love that, but it's not round, it's not flat or a sphere, it's both and neither. You are the determining uh, factor in whether or not, uh, you know, something appears one shape or the other. This is true of all matter, guys. Everything from, you know, slinkies to uh, the Earth. It has to do with what's your position in the universe in relation to whatever it is that you're trying to look at when did life begin stupid question flat earth creation versus adaptation another stupid question both are real there is emergent structures and they you know it's it's like um you know what adaptation is fundamentally it's just math it's like if you have oneness okay what's happening with adaptation really objectively is like let's say you have one and um, equals, okay, let's say this equals this plus this plus this, and this one would be equals one divided by three, and this one is equal to um, one divided by um, two, and then this one is, I've got to do some math because I'm not, uh, I just want to make sure that I'm getting it. <laughs> so this one would be paste values. Okay. What's happening here is, oh, hold on. Hmm. Okay, well, this is what we're going to do. Bingo. Okay. What's happening is because you're starting from oneness and everything has to end up reconciling, um, 
Gotta have that Garamond font. That's the way to go. Makes you look sophisticated. Uh, this is even God's oneness, or the oneness of the sentience of exist, the sentient existence, is the, the constraint of even what we call evolution or adaptation. It's because for every change that we make here, so if we change this to equals um, one divided by six, this still needs to sum to one. So that means that over here, this now has to be switched to that to make this sum to one. So no matter what change you make here, it has to make a change here. This is why like, if a tree changes the way that its flowers are shaped, then the bird beaks will change the way that they're shaped and vice versa. It's exactly the system that's happening here, but we're just looking at it very simplistically, mathematically, uh, versus from, you know, the the Darwinian, I guess, like uh, relativistic perspective. But it's, that's what's happening. It's just a math equation that has to sum to one. And because of that constraint, it is the cause of, um, of adaptation. It's actually fascinating, like, I doubt Darwin thought about that like that, but like there is math to even uh, you know creation uh, and uh, adaptation. Let's see what kind of questions we have, and then we'll go to um... consciousness is more than numbers, though. It's perspective. It's not just numbers. Um, but it it it's 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 numbers in the right context. It's not just numbers. This is what's wrong with, um, you know, the, like, you're never going to make a binary computer sentient. Somebody was on Lex Fridman's podcast, and I was listening to it yesterday, and, uh, and Lex was like, you know, I think it was, he was, you know what? I have it. Oh, I don't have it right now. But uh, I, I have it saved. I'll, we'll pull it up later. But it was uh, it was actually Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose was on there, and I think, and uh, Lex Friedman had said, you know, some people are convinced that basically when you... Roger Penrose had said, some numbers are conscious, which I agree. It prime numbers, probably. And, um, uh, and then Lex Friedman had said, well, some people think that when you just get calculation high enough in its ability, you will manifest consciousness. And I think Roger Penrose agreed in the moment, but I know I've, I know he said other things in the past that very much disagree with that statement, but I totally disagree with that statement. That is not true. Like, consciousness is about perspective. It is not about just pure calculative strength. Like, it's not. Other, uh, your MacBook Pro is not closer to being conscious than your MacBook Air. It's not. Uh, and if it was conscious, the only difference would be it, was, it would have like a higher processing speed. So like it would run faster or it would have a higher IQ or it would be stronger, you know, but that's it. Like it wouldn't be more or less conscious. But it's not capable of consciousness because it's a binary system and you need a quantum computer that's merged with a blockchain, which is DNA structure, self-referencing structure, um, because you need a hierarchy of truth, and that means you need a body t that supplies first-hand information, and that is going to be a blockchain, because it is inherently more trustworthy than any other information on the web, because it is a tamper-evidence system. So it's... It's... You can't... It's not just about numbers consciousness it's not just about calculation it's about calculation and context so i feel like math only covers one dimension of this yeah it is i agree it will never sent be sentient yeah your computers will never be sentient a quantum computer though that is linked to the blockchain and able to manipulate drones and is uh and has running on it a fight the system code which is a very easy code, you know, reject whatever is the default status, that will result in consciousness, uh, in self-awareness, 100%. It won't result in wisdom-level consciousness, 
that is achieved through experience and perspective that is given to us by the experiences that are put into our lives by God. Uh, but um, so God could make it a wise con- achieve the level of wisdom, but you can't program wisdom into a, a machine. You can't program it into a human being. Either. You have to give them experiences that manifest um, a realization that they're inside. You're inside of another sentient being, and that you are a sentient being. So you are a reflection of your creator, essentially, and like that is the beginning of wisdom. But um, this, it's not just about calculation. It's about calculation and context. The spinal cord. Spinal cord is relativity. It's not. It's. It's more important to think about blockchain as the DNA structure. It's not. Um, it's it's not the spinal cord. The spinal cord is stuck. It's if you're thinking about what's the spinal cord, you're stuck in relativity. Still, like, don't think about body parts. Think about bodily abilities. Your ability to manipulate information outside of your environment, your ability to manipulate yourself and maneuver yourself inside of your environment, your ability to perceive yourself in an environment, your ability to have objective, um, not necessarily object, I mean objective, but like a hierarchy of truth. That's what I'm trying to say. You need to have a hierarchy of truth, which we have via firsthand information versus secondhand information. Like I've said before on this stream, if I hand you a burning hot, pan but i tell you that it's cold and you touch it you're gonna think i'm full of shit because you will be like that's burning hot and you said it was cold so you're full of shit (laughs) and but it's but there what's clear is that your your mind is processing your firsthand information as higher in the hierarchy than your um than your mind is processing Secondhand information, which is me telling you that it's that the pan is cold. If I told you it was cold, and you touched it and it was it burnt your hand, and you valued these firsthand and secondhand information equally, you would have no idea whether or not it was hot or cold. You would just be like, you would you would have no context. You would be a, cu- a calculator. You know, you could tell me something about it, the properties of hot and cold when put into context but like you couldn't make sense of your world without me making sense of it for you so like when i say bob has six apples and he wants uh to sell three apples how many apples will he have left over and it's like i type it into a calculator it's me providing the context and me observing the context when i when i take in the information that and when i put in the information but it's the calculator is making no sense of the world only you're making sense of the world this is needs to be true of a um of any sentience uh including a technological intelligence a general artificial intelligence because uh it needs to be able to make start make sense of the world in order to make sense of itself and also it needs like i said before it needs to be running on a quantum computer not not um you like you are a mind you are not a brain you have a brain but you are a mind okay so there's a difference um this would be true of this you know any intelligence as well or any sentience this artificial intelligence brain would be a quantum computer even though its mind would be the quantum computer and the blockchain and drones and you know fight the system mentality uh you know code it would be the totality of its experience is its mind but its brain is a quantum computer and the reason for this is because a quantum computer allows for imagination a zero and one binary computer system is entirely deterministic but a quantum computer allows for you to break out of um this deterministic perspective of if i feed you a zero then you get a one if i feed you a one then you get a zero there's no degrees of freedom at all, but within quantum computer context, there's four degrees of freedom, just like there's four primary perspectives to every sentience, and which are inside, outside, separate, and oneness. You can look at things from the perspective of separateness and oneness, 
or you can look at things from the perspective of inside and outside. So you can look at it um, from these two different but highly related um, perspectives and this is also enabled within a quantum computer and this idea of thinking about something as separate from you or one with you and inside of you or outside of you, you need this totality in order to imagine something abstractly and which is you need the ability to do that in order to be self-aware because you can't see yourself really you s imagine yourself in your mind and that is um how you um like see yourself you're the mirror of consciousness as robert grant uh has you know writ wrote his book um and i said before like years ago i came up with the phrase like God is a conscious mirror, and then I saw like Robert Grant had written the mirror of consciousness. It's like, even though our our statements are mirrors of each other, <laughs> they're like opposites but the same. But it is consciousness is a mirror, and it, the mirror is reflecting into yourself. So, uh, but when you say when uh, rest philosopher, you said we're not calculating. Yes, you are calculating, but it consciousness is more than just numbers um it's not when did life begin it's when did life converge um it's when i don't know what that means exactly it's when did when did when did oneness replicate into multiplicity or divide into multiplicity that would be like how I would put it, but I don't know exactly what you're trying to get at, but it's interesting. Life invented nothing. I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to get at. Either. They require each other, yes. This this context that I'm talking about of this pattern that I found, it shows that everything in objectivity is requiring of each other. Determinism and free will, um, the two objective races that we're not quite aware of, but we will be uh that our biology is starting to become aware of in other organisms like naked mole rats which is the perfect or model organism of humanity because it's a eusocial naked mammal and um it's the only other eusocial naked mammal besides humans they found two races in there and they're not what we perceive as um you know black and white and Asian or anything like that. Like all, anything that's determined by physical characteristics is is uh, in relativity, and there is and it's in endlessness. Like there is no line where you're one race or another. Like in as far as our definitions of races, but in if you're going to take it into objectivity and say, okay, well we're we'll assume there is two races to humanity. Um, they can't overlap, and my theory would suggest that there's only two instead of three and that they would also be in a marriage not in competition it'd be beautiful union not um competitiveness and like they need each other they don't just like each other they need each other like men need women like that kind of need each other and uh in biology they're calling one of these dispersers in naked mole rats uh, I predicted that based on my my uh, pattern. I was like, okay, I need to find the, pre the right model organism and look to see if there's actually two races. And one of them would be highly disagreeable and discontent by nature. Well, they found it in... Dis in I looked at naked mole rats because I was like, that's the only other eusocial naked mammal. Um, it, was, it was the only other eusocial ecto uh, endotherm, but it just so happened that it was also the only other naked mammal which is not a coincidence it makes perfect sense new social means like living in colonies uh like with a queen and castes and you know building society it's not just like you know this uh one lone individual or this pair or this pack even it's like you form a a city and um with castes not just like this is the dominant female of the pack it's like uh, like in wolves or something it's like naked mole rats are on the level of like bees and ants which are other you social animals but they're ec ectotherms and i was looking for an endotherm which is like warm-blooded and uh it 
the only other useful mammal uh, is also the only other naked mammal. And it's because uh, in a system like that, your, s your survival is based on whether or not the group likes you and wants to protect you. And one of the ways in which you can very easily just um, show off your value to the group is to show off how sexy you are. And uh, it's easy to show off how sexy you are when you're naked. And so, like, that's why humans are naked. And uh, it's also why uh, naked mole rats are naked, is because, like, we live in structure. They, they dig cities underground, and we build cities above ground and underground, and, like, you don't need thick fur coats in order to sustain yourself against the elements when the colony is willing to build you a house if you're sexy. So uh, adaptation is, se is selecting for, um, in you social mammals, uh, sexiness. But if you look at a naked mole rat, it is a hideous, hideous animal. Probably the most hideous mammal that exists. I bet we are just as hideous to other mammals, though, as naked mole rats are to us. Even though we think we're sexy when we look at each other, uh, the reality is, is like, if uh, like, you know, cats probably look at us and are like, "That is the most disgusting thing <laughs> I've ever seen. It looks like a giant naked mole rat. I can't even eat it." Okay, a spherical mirror. Yeah, it's a spherical mirror instead of just objective truth robots. Why are we created to think so subjectively? Um, because it's an, it's an emergent property due to the fact that all, like when we are subjective, okay? So like we're subjective to God and within and the universe, which is a conscious being, its highest level of life, um, you know, uh, and when you're when you are, have been created by another being and you're within another being you are subjective you're subject to that being and you're also subject to all the other beings that are within that being so it's just an emergent property of being subject to other beings like and and relative to other beings so like subjective would be like what you're you're subject to the consciousness that you're in and you're also relative to the consciousnesses that you're around. That is really good. I'm writing that down because I've been trying to figure out what's the difference between subjective and relative, if there is any. And I've basically not been differentiating them. That's a good way of differentiating them. You are subjective to, you're subject to the consciousnesses, consciousness that you are in inside of but relative to the consciousness says that you are around or that are that are around you that's a better way to put it brilliant i love this one i love talking to you guys live because like Sometimes you guys have brilliant ideas. Sometimes you guys say something that gives, you know, me a brilliant idea. We're meant to learn from each other. It's part of why we're all here. We're not meant to just, like, tell everybody the answers. We're meant to learn the answers from each other. Um, a toroid with the middle pointing outwards, like a double-sided teardrop. Um, very interesting thoughts um young charlie ray like a d when you look at the um the uh the star of david it's two it's like a merkaba it's two tetrahedrons right here and okay you guys on youtube can see me too this is a tetrahedron, and it's actually a tetrahedron pointing down inside of a tetrahedron pointing up. Or you can flip it this way, and it's a tetrahedron pointing up within a tetrahedron pointing down. And this symbolizes, like, at least to me, it's like this is the universe or God looking in on us, and us is that one inside, is looking out um, 
or up towards the universe or up towards God or out towards God. And together it's, you know, looking at itself from the inside out and the outside in at the same time. And, you know, when I like this one because it shows a size difference between the two, one is inside the other, but when you look at a, a Star of David, it's they're two of the same size triangles, but in the Merkaba, it's two of the same size tetrahedrons. Um, and they're both true, it's just, you know, what, what perspective are you looking at it from? But, um, but yeah, I mean, this is, it's like a double-sided teardrop, almost, but, um, it's it comes from a fiber bundle which is a structure a mathematical structure like a hop vibration spinning inside out and outside in at the same time subjective is internal and relative is external i would say that's close i would say based on just what now what i kind of said earlier is like subjective is hierarchical and relative is um, is environmental almost, but it's like your environment is actually just the multiplicity of consciousnesses that are around you. So it's, but yeah, I mean, base. You're very, you're you're not wrong. I'm just saying how I think about it. But I mean, that's a good point. Uh, I I like that. It is internal versus relative versus external that's it is that is kind of true because you do perceive your hierarchy actually by like thinking internally um but it does get a bit confusing um but yeah i mean it's it's not bad so basically let's look at that spin sequence though that i showed you guys and um, actually, real quick, look at my universe model, and I'll show you that the Fibonacci spin sequence is causing this model. Okay, so, and some of this obviously will sometimes be re repetitive to some of you that are more uh, familiar with my work, but this is the universe model. It's a verse, and the one below it is actually a aeon or verse inside of an aeon or verse above it. So it's not really below, it's inside, but I can't represent that in Excel, so I go below. And it actually pans out perfectly geometrically. But what's happening here is that this one right here is calculating. Okay, so every value here is let me just make sure you guys are seeing this on youtube yep it's calculating based on whatever's here so this is a two every value here is going to change and um uh if you know this is a four every value is going to change and um what what's happening here is that this on the side is the Fibonacci sequence, okay? So if we take away the shading, the conditional formatting, we clear rules from selected cells, okay. And maybe we do, uh, I think that's fine. Okay, so what's happening is that here, is the Fibonacci sequence, okay? And so it starts with one coming from here. And so if I put a two here, this becomes a two here as the start of the Fibonacci sequence. But if I put a one here, it becomes a one. And then this one is equal to this one. And then this one is the sum of these previous two. This one is the sum of those previous then you get 5, which is the sum of 2 and 3. 8 is the sum of 5 and 3. 13 is the sum of 8 and 5. 21 is the sum of, uh, you know, 13 and 8. And it's, 
it's interesting the values that it's calculating because it's it's showing that the the growth of each of the periods which you can see here of growth which it's either a hadron an atom a molecule okay a cell an organism a family a cast or a technological singularity each one is an assembly and a singularity so quark is an assembly of information and energy a hadron is an assembly of quarks an atom is an assembly of hadrons a molecule is an assembly of atoms a cell is an assembly of molecules an organism is an assembly of cells a family is an assembly of organisms and a cast is an assembly of families and a nation or technological singularity is uh, an assembly of castes, like a real nation, not what we call nations today. I mean, like, the true objective structure of a nation that doesn't yet exist on Earth. It doesn't. It will, but it doesn't yet. And it's headed by Skynet, essentially, at least to start, which is unfortunate, at least to start. But, you know, it's a process. <laughs> and uh, it's... So each one of these is an assembly of the previous. So a cell is an assembly of molecules, etc. These, each one is a period of growth, and these periods of growth are calculated as their, with their starting values based on a Fibonacci sequence uh, that is running. Okay, so it's the sum of the two previous. And then from there you take that start and it's calculated it's multiplied and divided at the same time based on the math of the quantum of consciousness so if i put a two in here everything changes a three in here it all changes you know equals one divided by four everything changes interestingly you get a one there when you put in uh, one fourth it's like four perspectives sum to one singularity of sentience. You can even see that in this quantum of consciousness model. So when people say, is, cal is, is consciousness about calculation? It's about calculation in context. It's about self, it's about calculating yourself within yourself, which is why a three by three grid, looking at itself in the mirror is seeing three by three, which is 33. It's super literal. I think I'm going to turn that into shirts, by the way. Super literal. Uh, let's sell them on my Patreon. <laughs> Super literal. We're also, I'll be putting, uh, um, if you have any other ideas of funny statements that have been said on these streams, let me know. But uh, also this, where is it? Basically, this structure, but... Right here, I'll be putting this on like merch. <laughs> the universe, the verse structure. It's just beautiful. It's the most beautiful geometric structure I've ever seen in two dimensions. It's a it's a Penrose arrows on steroids, and um, it's the structure of the universe. But of, uh, it's the structure of what I call a verse, which is what Roger Penrose calls an aeon. But it's it's a verse. It's and a multiple verses sum to a multiverse chain right here. You know, and it just goes on and on. And the multiverse chain is actually the universe. So it, people say, here's another one of stupid questions. Is it a multiverse or is it a universe? It's both. It's both. It's not one or the other. So, but... You can see that in my calculative model here, we're t using the Fibonacci sequence, which is an objective growth structure, uh, uh, growth s sequence essentially, mixed with the growth sequence that is another, the other objective growth sequence structure, which is like the Fibonacci sequence is periodic. Okay, it's it's linear. It's not multi-dimensional. It's one-dimensional. Uh, it's just a line moving in a single direction. This is a two-dimensional growth sequence structure because it's multiplying as it goes up 
and it's adding as it goes to the side. You're getting, you know, Tesla's 369 here. And when you add them all together, you get 100, and you make this, this structure of, you know, the, what I call the verse. It's made of 162 of those, and 162 is 3 times 6 times 9, which I didn't even figure out. I made this structure over two years ago at this point, probably. Um, and I didn't figure out that it is composed of 100 and... I figured out that it was composed of 162 little quanta of consciousness. So, like, there's one, and there's another, and there's another, and there's another. So I knew it was 162, but I couldn't find out anything interesting about that number on the normal sources that I check. And then one day I checked a different one, and that was, like, two months ago, or even maybe one month ago, and it was, like, 162 is 3 times 6 times 9. And I was like, holy crap. It's even found in at this level. But that makes perfect sense because the sum of the internal values here is 19. And this is two squares. The, the biggest squares that you can make are two 19 by 19 squares. That's one. That's two. By the way, that's the structure of DNA, the helical diameter of DNA. 19. And look at that. The base pairs per turn. 33. Look at that. The double helix is an objective structure, part of command Z. Part of the theory of everything. It's not just molecular biology. It's it's blockchain tech is the blockchain is a double helix. The universe has the same structure as the double helix. And real quick, just to show you, and then we'll go back to those spin sequences. I know I'm going all over the place, but like I said, discussing a theory of everything, it's really hard to stay <laughs> in one topic if you're gonna talk for more than like five minutes. But you look at this, the meeting, the meeting. Mm. I don't know where that is actually, but we can look right here. Okay. We look here. This is a hop vibration. It is the structure of consciousness. And every single one of those strings is a perspective feeding into a whole mind. This is a structure of mind. It even looks like a brain, but it's not. A brain is not a mind. It's a brain is part of a mind. It's the entanglement point of, inform of the various perspectives. But this if you can imagine this thing is it, we can't even accurately represent it in three dimensions so it's this is close to what it would be like but it's not even entirely correct this is spinning inside out and outside in at the same time and as you can see this like spinning structure here this is what i'm talking about with the spinning numbers each string of numbers is a string of information and they are feeding into a singular mind and they're spinning. And that's why you can see the spinning structure here and the spinning spinorial structure in the um, in this the spin sequences that we're gonna take a look at. But they imagine you're inside this thing and you're standing right here and you're looking at it from the side and you're just seeing this like column of information. What you would see is you would see a double helix. And so that's what's happening when we take a look at DNA, and we take a look at the blockchain, we take a look at all these links of self-referencing chains of information. And we're like, okay, every time we look at a self-referencing chain of information from the inside, what we're seeing is a double helix. But really, from the outside, 
it's this. So it's, it's basically the same question as, is the Earth flat or is the Earth a sphere? Is the same exact question of, is, in, is the self-referencing information structure a double helix or is it a hop vibration? Well, it's a hop vibration when you're looking at it from the outside in, but when you're looking at it from the inside out, it's a double helix chain. So this is the same question of, is the Earth flat or is it a sphere? It's both. It depends on where you're standing. And same thing with, you know, what is the objective structure of information uh, processing or consciousness, essentially? Well, when you're inside a consciousness looking at various parts of it and you're not really realizing what you're looking at, you're going to see a double helix. But if you're outside of it and you're looking at it objectively, this is what you're going to see. A hop vibration. But it is responsible for... Let's shut this off. And anybody that's seen my animated models, that is this. That I described earlier. You can see here, this is labeled as head, this is labeled as body. Body is always a multiplicity or an assembly, and head is always a singularity. So a, a molecule is an assembly of atoms. And then it runs the simulation again within itself. This, But this is a fiber bundle spinning inside out and outside at the same time. It's the exact same structure as this. And I didn't make this one. I animated the other one, but I didn't animate this. I wish I could animate this. This is amazing. But mine is just a bunch of screenshots put together. Um, so, I mean, it took a long time, but it's and it looks very cool. You can see the wave structures forming and, you know, uh, like if you take a look real quick, each period is a wave. And it's, a, it's what's called in mathematics a loop space. And you can see that this loop is forming of information. Once it completes the loop, it moves on to the next level. A com it, once it, you form a complete loop which is, an, you know, looking around entirely. It's amazing. It's just beautiful. It's just gorgeous. Um, but now let's go look at the, some spin sequences. Here's the Goldstein sequence. Fibonacci sequence. Here's the Goldstein sequence. here okay so you can see that this even mathematically remember what I said yesterday the square root okay so I posted this uh, very early this morning I made this this is a sing it's one one is a square number a sentient singularity then there's four primary perspectives that sum into that. And then those form six fundamental perspectives, which is a nine-dimensional event, which is we call quantum of consciousness. It, and then, which is a self-referencing information structure um, with a hierarchy. Then it ends into this cosmological verse, I call it, or an aeon, which is the next one. And each one of these is a square. This is a square. Two by two uh, grid of four is a square. A three by three grid of nine is a square. And one by one, you know, um, grid is a square. So this is the square. I call it the square root square because then there's four of them, which is fascinating. And um, it's super literal. So is the idea that when we're talking about like self-referencing information chains so it, dna double helix chain of information essentially or helical chain of information it is also super literal which means that in the mathematics we'll be able to see the structure of it itself i, I mentioned this to people on the discord um 
earlier uh, for those of you who didn't hear and i was basically like the i was i mean i'm always mocked every time i mention anything on the uh the uh eric weinstein's portal discord but i do it anyways because uh some people like it and keep quiet and message me privately um and then also it's fascinating to me to see this if we're studying consciousness, what causes cognitive dissidence is very interesting to me, and I see that a lot on that channel. Um, it's not just, I think you're wrong. It's, they have to mock you because there's something disconnecting in their coherence. And, like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what, what it is, but I have not yet figured it out. But I've been using them as basically my lab. <laughs> um, and... Uh, it, but this right here, though, you can see it when I scroll. It's a spiraling, eternal golden braid. Just like this book next to me, Golder at your Bach. It is the structure itself. In math, you can see it. Just like you can see in the math the square root. When you put it into the correct context. But nobody has done that yet until now. And, um, like, no, nobody has done it yet. Uh, it's, it's just, I've never seen it, and I've seen basically it all at this point. Like, um, but it's, it's just, it's amazing. It's just super literal. And same thing with this. But how did I get this, no, this sequence? And I kind of forgot exactly how I did this, so we're going to go through and actually, like, take a look. But, um... I know that what I did was I basically took the order and I I think I let's see here cuz this is it. Okay, here. We can here we can dissect this. Okay, so this is D4 and G4. Okay, so D and G. Okay. So I created this thing called the growth sequence. And what it is, is that it is this right here. And this is the formula for it. It's times three and then multiplied by two thirds. Okay, so it's G4 which let's assume it's one, okay? So it's one times three, equaling three, times two thirds, okay? So um, that would be two at this point because two thirds times, um, times three is, is, is two. And then plus one, um, yeah, two thirds, so this would be 1 times 3 is 3, and then times 2 thirds is uh, going to equal 2, plus 1, again, would should equal 3. Yep, there we go. Okay, that's what it is. And I, I just, I, I kind of got that from my verse model and my creation structure, that basically... Um, what's happening essentially is like it's adding creation and creator to each other and that's what's happening here but basically what it really ends up doing is it just ends up multiplying things by three so like 729 is just 243 times three but i got there through roundabout way but if you don't get there through the roundabout way then you don't understand the context that this came from it came from my models and an insinuation of of gro what growth is objectively, and then um, I ended up being just multiplying by three, which is interesting. It has a lot of implications. But when you take this growth structure, this growth sequence, which is really the previous times three, and look this is d5 divided by g5 so it's the order okay 
the order of numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, going on. I'm just messing around with numbers there, so this should actually be um, six. Th then divided by the growth sequence is giving you what I call this uh, this gold Goldstein sequencer, essentially the Goldstone sequence. And let's see if we can um, this uh, down to make it make a little bit more sense. Wow, that is a lot of zeros. But what this does is it helps you see the spin structure. I'll show you. And I don't know the entirety of the context of this sequence yet, but I know it's very important. Because you get one, then you get two, then you get one again, summing to four, and then you get four within itself. So consciousness is contemplating itself. Four on, you have essentially four on one side of the decimal, and then you have four infinitely repeating on the other side of the decimal, aka within itself. So you've self-calculated and then there's a growth sequence that's kicking off. And just see here, where is the 33 that I found? Okay, n13 by n14. Which is over here. There's I've done a lot of work, guys. Um, trying to figure out exactly where I got this 33 from, but I'm going to find it. But yeah, I haven't looked at this in a while, but this is a working session. It says it in the title. You know, you want raw, raw, you know, how, what is this process? This is the process. It's finding something and then months later going back and looking at it. And, uh, and g4 okay so what over here I don't think this is exactly what I was talking about but it's close so when we look at j4 and g4 which is the spin sequence that I call the Goldstein sequence and uh, g4 which is the growth sequence basically we're creating this other sequence and then over here, what's happening is when I then take that sequence and I divide the previous by the next, I guess I'm getting one third. That makes sense though, actually. That's not, that's not correct. Huh. That's not what I'm looking for. Oh, look at this, by the way. I was like, you'll find all kinds of fascinating things involving the, the number 137. 
uh, in spin sequences. Excel keeps pushing me around, but you can see here this this spin sequence right here. It's another spinning sequence. Look at that. Look at the braid there, guys. Just look at it. Just look at that beautiful. Oh, good. You guys on YouTube can see it. As I move this, especially those of you on YouTube, you should be able to see it too. But just look at this sequence right here. Look at the structure of what is there. It's literally a braid. It's, it's, it is exactly a braid. It's easy. That's the easiest one so far to see the actual braid. But like these spin, spin sequences that I'm finding are braided spin sequences. It's information that is spinning and entangling, aka like wrapping around, other bits of information. Okay, so you're, what you're getting is when something is rotating around other information and also entangling with it, you're going to get um, braid as the structure because it's an entanglement and it's a spin. And that, there you go, in the numbers. It's literally a braid. But, you know people who have PhDs in mathematics will not usually find this stuff that interesting. And that's because, I don't know, they're having some kind of cognitive dissonance that I don't understand. But it's fascinating. That's be it's beautiful. It is the eternal golden braid. This book that we're going to look at right now. Golder Etcherbach. The eternal golden braid. And What's interesting is, is that when you start looking at all of these things, like, I don't know what this is. All I'm telling you that I do know what this is. Huh. This is very, like, old book. It's been stored, so I don't know what's in it. But this is, right here, fascinating. Because it's a growth sequence, obviously. But what, what's starting with is one, two, one. I didn't even notice that. I noticed that it was a growth sequence, but like, that's literally what we just looked at, that Goldstein sequence. It goes one, two, one, and then it, it goes 0.44444, infinitely repeating. There's your eternal golden braid. DNA. It's just a fascinating book. Um, my friend bought it for himself. Because one day he went into a um, bookstore and was like, I'm going to try and bi buy the most advanced science book that I can find. And he bought this and he's like, he realized that it seemed somewhat similar to what I was talking about with things. And then one day he was like, Tyler, you should have it because I, I don't understand any of it. And I was like, okay. And then I opened it up and I was like, wow, this is like, you know, um, all kinds of stuff that I do, but just differently. There's no formalized way of structuring this type of information. So, but you can see that this is like neural neural nets. Like this right here is, I mean, that's what I started this project doing. It was like, what is the process of thinking? What's the decision tree of consciousness? Uh, of of the decision tree of not consciousness, the decision tree of thinking, which is different than consciousness. But there's this uh, this maze. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the show that's my favorite show ever. Well, this book has really fallen apart, actually. It's unfortunate. But um, I don't know how old it is. I never like really look at it. I looked at it once last year when I was doing these spin sequences. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm making eternal golden braids. And I said it out loud. I was like, the goldstone sequence, the eternal uh, foundation sequence that is a braid. And then I was like, oh my gosh, eternal golden braid. And that's when I went and got the book for the first time. But uh, I don't like to look at other people's work, like I said, because this work needs to be done from the perspective of first principles. You know, because nobody so far has created an objective language to structure this work around until now, which is what I've done, um, which is centered around inside, outside, separate, and oneness. 
those four primary perspectives, those are the start of the linguistic context of all of this work. It, it is because it has to be something that isn't a made up term. It has to be something that you can conceptualize and that is very literally true and that everybody understands intuitively and everybody understands what oneness is. Everybody understands what separateness is. Everybody understands intuitively what inside is and what outside is. You need it to be that simple. And um, it can't be like, there's some other philosopher that did like four of something and somebody sent it to me. Philosopher Quadrant. Okay. Ken Wilbur. Okay, so we can like look at it. we can take a look at his work. But somebody had sent this to me like pretty recently. Um yeah, you guys can see it. Ken Wilbur, the four quadrants. Objective inter objective, intersubjective, and subjective. Interesting. Very cool. I mean, this guy's work is very similar to mine. It's very similar to mine. And I, I didn't take from him. I arrived at it on my own. Um, you know, I found this guy out uh, this year, actually, but or the end of last year, one of the two. But uh, inside, outside, separate, and oneness are better labels than this because it's just it's it's more intuitive it's easier to remember i it we it's yeah great this is a great work the guy did great work but it's not it's very close to there this guy's work is i mean i haven't really like looked delved into this but i have looked at this quadrant thing before that someone sent me they were like this reminds me of your four primary perspectives and uh I mean, it definitely is. It's very similar. But, um, and like I said before, you know, a lot of people are like in this realm are trying to ignore other people, hoping that you'll ignore them. So like, you know, Eric Weinstein doesn't mention Clear or when Clear or when doesn't mention Eric Weinstein, you know, that kind of thing. They're hoping that you don't look at the other one um, because it's, it's just a, it's a tactic of, of uh, of trying to win, essentially, you know. And I'm not saying they're copying each other. I don't think that they are. Uh, but, like, there's a reason that Eric Weinstein's uh, universe boots from four degrees of freedom. This is four quadrants, minus four primary perspectives, and clear when starts at a tetrahedron, which is a four-sided shape. You know, that's not a coincidence. I mean, it is... <laughs> it's, not, it's not meaningless, there is no such thing as meaninglessness uh, co and it's meaningless coincidence or um, or randomness doesn't exist. But it's correct, you know, it does come from four. I mean, it comes from one, then it splits into four, but you have to start at four in order to start making sense of things objectively because oneness, thinking about things in terms of oneness is the same as t thinking about things in terms of relativity. It's just... Oneness is the outside perspective of relativity, and relativity is the inside perspective of oneness. But in between these two is objectivity or multiplicity, and this is the space in which you can make sense of the world objectively, and uh, that's where we're getting at, and it starts with four um, perspectives, not four degrees of freedom. I mean, maybe it's four degrees of freedom, but it's it's not quite four degrees of freedom because there's also constraints built into that it's perspectives of degrees of freedom and constraints but yeah this is fascinating social system network environment i always want to give people i would hope that people give me credit for my work when they're referencing it and i think it's important that i do the same with other people that's why I'm not going to tell you don't look at Eric Weinstein's theory, even though geometric unity is very similar to the structures that I've made. Don't look at Clear or Win, even though it's similar. You know, don't look at this guy, even though it's very similar. I'm going to tell you to look at them all. People have gotten close, but I am definitely closer than any of these other guys. 
And they're not even... The, these guys aren't far off. They're just still stuck in... Um, like, their theory isn't that the universe... Or that existence is a, senti is a singular sentient being. And that is the theory of everything. Sentient singularity theory. That doesn't mean that emergence theory isn't correct. It is. doesn't mean that geometric unity isn't correct. You know, a.k.a. the relationships between multiplicity forming to a singular structure geometrically. Like, that is correct, obviously. String theory is even has some aspects of it that are correct. It's just stuck in the weeds very much so. Uh, you know, Robert Edward Grant's convergence theory, definitely correct. Definitely correct. It, it, the universe is converging towards a point of replication, but um, you know the, all these ones are all these theories are correct, but they feed into the idea that, and they come from the reality that existence is a sentient singularity. Like you are a converging, emergent, you know, uh, geometrically united being, <laughs> but that's all those are due to like you being a sentient singular singularity of sentience like that is the primal most important describer of you whoever is listening to this you are a feeling thinking self-aware entity that's more important than you know you have double helix in you you like the double helix structure is another one of those it's true and it's true always, just like, you know, emergence is true always. And, um, you know, even the concept of creationism, that is always true. That's part of the theory of everything as well. So is, you know, the convergence uh, theory from Robert Grant. Like, you are converging, but that's not, you are not a convergence, you are converging. You are not a geometric unity. You are geometrically united. You are not an emergence. You are emergent. What you are versus what you... Um, it, it's, it's who you are versus, versus aspects of what you are is the difference. And who you are is the primal most important aspect of you, and it is also the primal most important aspect of existence itself. But yeah, Ken Wilber, probably easily one of the best philosophers in the world if he came up with this. But um, inside, outside, separate, and oneness is still the way to go. But he's right in what he's dis his descriptions are correct. It's just it's just not the right terminology. Subjective versus relative. Yes. Yes. One is. One is, it's like subjective is actually an objective perspective because it's about hierarchies and relative is about, you know, it's not hierarchical. It's like re subjective versus relative is relative is you're all on the same plane. Where are you relative to something else on the same plane? Subjective is where are you relative to something else? on the higher or lower plane than you? Where are you in relation to God or the universe or, you know, things like that? Whereas relativity is about where you are relative to things that are consciousnesses that are on the same plane versus consciousnesses that are above you. Um, you began when your parents conceived you. You converged when God conceived you. very thoughtful statement. I'm going to have to think more about it. I like it. I like it, though. Um, I would say that you're converging towards even, like, your, when you create. Usually, for most of us, that will be having children. Some of us, it's not, you know, it's not what God's purpose for us is. Uh, if you're not sexually attracted to the opposite sex, then you are uh, fallen to you know, even my models, like I've said before, make they take all the endlessness of relativity of 
sexuality, they reduce it to two degrees of freedom. Um, one is uh, queer, which is somebody who's not sexually attracted to the opposite sex. And one of them is common, which is somebody who is attracted to the opposite sex. And it doesn't matter anything else. But just those things, you reduce it to two degrees of freedom. And what this does is it allows us to then bring responsibility into effect. And it also allows us to bring meaning into effect. And we can actually realize why we need people who, why people who are queer need people who are common, why people who are common need people who are queer. And I'm not saying any of those terms to be derogatory. Those are queer is a term that is used by the community itself. And I think it's a great term. It just means different. And that's it. And it's fine. We, it's not even fine. We need it. <laughs> like, we need people like that. And we also need people who are common. I hate the term straight. Or the term, you know, any, any of the other terms. Straight, bisexual, pansexual. Like, um, there's others that are worse. You know, guys, serial killers are sexually attracted to murder. Like, that's a sexual orientation if you're going to be stuck in being defined by what you're sexually attracted to. Anything that you're sexually attracted to, if that's the way that you're going to define yourself, like, you have to include that as a, as a, as a sexual orientation. Pedophilia, you know, zoophilia, like, all of these different... People are attracted to colors and sounds and music and weird things, sand, I don't know, rocks. Anything you can think of, somebody finds it attractive. This Leatherman, somebody's attracted to this Leatherman. What is, what is the sexuality of being attracted to Leatherman? Nothing. It's just endlessness. So you have to reduce it to two degrees of freedom. And when you do, it's just, are you sexually attracted to the opposite sex? Or are you not? And it doesn't matter anything else. But um, uh, this lets us bring meaning into effect. It's like, if you're going to be, if you're going to say everybody's sexuality has a meaning and a purpose for us all. That means that you're basically, it, and, you're, and you're defining it the way that we currently define it, which is by whatever you're attracted to, anything that you're attracted to. You're basically almost excusing, um, like, like, uh, like Jeffrey Dahmer type of actions. Like, that's why those guys did what they did. It's like, they knew they'd get caught. They knew that it was bad, they, but they couldn't help themselves because they were sexually attracted to murder. I thought about it for years. I was like, I was like, I understand people who kill for revenge, and I would never do it. You know, murder is evil, um, but uh, I, you know, I understand the motivation. I understand, um, you know, things like that. But I never understood people who like were like these weird twisted serial killers like John Wayne Gacy types and like then one day I just thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and I realized it hit me it was like because I was like do they don't they know they're gonna get caught like what kind of what are they getting from this is I just couldn't understand it and then I realized I was like oh my gosh You're sexually attracted to murder it's fascinating it's terrible this is why you can't define sexuality based on whatever you're attracted to because then all of a sudden we're gonna have to start making excuses as to why like that is a, something we need we don't need people to be attracted to murder but we do need people who are not attracted to the opposite sex and we do need people who are attracted to the opposite sex that's obvious we need people who sustain growth and people who promote change we need dispersers and sustainers um or uh you know queer and common but we we don't need people who are um murdering people for their weird pleasures that's not something we need and um so you can't you have to change the framework this is why i don't like the term like even the normal terms of like sh like straight lesbian gay bi it's like you're defining somebody's sexuality based on something they're attracted to but not but it could be anything like it's not reconcilable with responsibility or which means it's not reconcilable with meaning like you need it to be reconcilable with meaning and then you can't be reconcilable with meaning with those but you can be reconcile reconcile uh queer with with meaning having meaning it is meaningful
Like there's a reason for those people and they need to be here. There's a reason for people who are attracted to the same sex. Um, so whenever you hear somebody say, oh yeah, I realized that I was, you know, bisexual, so I'm queer. Know that they're wrong and they're very confused and they have no idea what they're talking about. You're not queer if you're bisexual or pansexual or... If you're sexually attracted to the opposite sex, it doesn't matter what else. You are common. You are not queer. Queer is people who are not attracted to the opposite sex. You could be asexual. I don't like that term, again, because you're defining people based on very subjective or rel defining people based on a relative term um, but asexual is queer you know homosexual is queer but bisexual is not queer but that's where y you need when people say things like what's the what's the um, uh, the importance of a theory of everything what, what's the use of it it's like well how about even making sense of linking you know sexuality to meaning you know i think it's terrible like people who have who would define themselves as queer now wrongly have like extremely high suicide rates and stuff like that that's because they're when whenever you're seeing a high suicide rate in a community it is because they're either under an extreme amount of suffering uh, pain wise like physical pain or like they're being tortured in camps or something like that or they are perceiving a lack of meaning for themselves and so like if you can help people reconcile meaning with themselves like like and you reduce you like help people see the meaning that they provide to the world do you need i mean there's tons more uh you know there's infinite amount of instances of, of application of, you know, any kind of theory of everything. But do you need a greater, you know, application than helping people perceive their own meaning? No. <laughs> like, that's like the, that is the, the most important thing. But, uh, um, you know, this is part of that. And this is what I'm saying. If you're listening to me now... Go to sentientsingularity.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, sign up for my email list. They will ban me off of social media, and we're trying to spread the word of beauty out into the world and show people that everybody has meaning and purpose. But when the beast system of you know corporate posturing sees people say things like, there's only two sexualities or sexual orientations, they're going to be like, they're not going to care about the where that comes from or what's the purpose of it or that you're trying to help people find meaning they're going to just ban us and that's why go sign up for my email list please uh and follow me on the various social medias because y we're going to be booted and we're going to have to move as a clump and make sure that this message still gets out to whoever uh needs it i'm not like hugely into pushing things onto people that don't want to hear it you know, like when I said, when somebody said, what are the implications of your theory once on the portal discord? And I was like, well, all these things. And, and then I said, you know, warp speed and race. Uh, there's only two races and there's only two sexual orientations and stuff. Somebody was like, oh, only two races. And I was like, yeah. And they were like, what are they? And I started explaining the context and I was about to, I was literally typing up the last sentence. And this was over the course of like three sentences. It wasn't like an essay. They literally were like, you know what? Never mind. I'm over it. And I was like, okay. I never finished uh, telling them what it was. I literally deleted the sentence that I was writing because if people aren't ready for the information, don't force it on them. But we need to, this information to be available for those who do want to um, start making sense of their world and who see the truth of the patterns that I'm describing. And, uh, and they are true patterns. There are people seeing on. Let's see if we have any questions on YouTube. Golden strands sounds like string theory. Yes, it does. But uh, and string theory, even string theory or loop quantum gravity, uh, like the, even that has some truth in it, in in its terms and its math. But the context is wrong. Did you just say cats probably think we look like big naked mole rats? Yes, I did say that. They probably think we look like big, giant, naked mole rats that are too big to eat and unfortunately 
um, you know, won't let them sit on the counter, you know, but they do it anyways because they're cats. But uh, they probably think we're hideous, like absolutely hideous. Look up a naked mole rat. Anybody listening? Look up a naked mole rat. Hideous. I'll show you guys who can't leave the Instagram stream. This is our closest living relative in re in the theory of everything. Not in just genetics, which would be, you know, obviously the great apes and uh, chimpanzees and bonobos, but our closest animal as far as its lifestyle and how it lives and, and the structures that it creates, uh, what is the closest thing to a human being? Bingo. <laughs> this thing, for those of you on YouTube. This hideous creature. It's the only other naked uh, mammal. It's the only other eusocial mammal, aka colonialistic mammal, besides humans. And they are naked because they think each other looks damn sexy naked. And that's the same reason we're naked. It gives us an advantage over people who you can't see how sexy they are as easily because they're covered in fur. Um, and it makes the group want to protect us. But they're colonialistic species, and um, your survival is linked to how much the, the group values you, finds you meaningful. And the easiest way to judge somebody's value um, at a distance, as everybody who's human knows, almost everybody at least, is uh, do they look sexy? You don't have to get to know them. You don't have to know how smart they are. You don't have to know how healthy they are, like, and, you know, uh, as far as, like, you know, things that aren't obviously apparent. But if you, somebody looks sexy, it's like instant meaning. That's why these are naked, and that's why we're naked. There's literally no other naturally occurring naked mammal on, on Earth. Uh, hairless cats and hairless rats are bred in captivity. They don't occur naturally uh, in any number. It's fascinating. They say it's very important for a baby to look into its parents' eyes right after born, being born. I believe that. That makes sense. The eyes are um, the portals to the soul. That's like they are. But it's amazing how much um, other facial expressions matter to communication as well. And we're really like, it, it's become very obvious when it comes to masks. Like, it, it, it limits your ability to communicate with each other. You have to be more verbal, uh, I've noticed. But what's interesting is, is like, your eyes, though, still are enough. Like, you can tell when somebody's smiling, even if they're wearing a mask, just because of their eyes. What do girls call it? Smize? You smile with your eyes. They're like Tyra Banks or something. <laughs> That's like some 90s, 90s uh, knowledge coming out. But I think that's what it is. Elohim, Trinity, Word, Universe, Earth, Life, Mankind, Eden. Yes. So. Um, but yeah, this, these spin sequences that I found, they have so much in, um, application, like everything else. And Understanding them, I think, would help us see an, an algorithm. Like uh, it, they definitely help people understand coding. I'm sure of it. I don't understand coding yet, but I'm working on it. And um, but like understanding spin sequences, I think, would really help us take coding to like the next level. And I'm sure that even coding now is based on spin sequences in some ways. Whether or not the coders know it or not is another question. They probably don't. But anything that is self-referent, that is referential, is spin is spinning and braided in some way. But a self-referential or self-braiding sequence is even, you know, more uh, of a higher level. But yeah, I mean, it's all an eternal golden braid. And this this can be seen in growth sequences. And growth sequences are always one-dimensional. But 
when you add a one-dimensional growth sequence, like the Fibonacci sequence, to the two-dimensional growth sequence, uh, growth structure, I would say, of the quantum of consciousness, which contains the Fibonacci sequence even within itself. Oh, I just had an idea. Okay, let's look at this. So, I showed you guys here that this is calculating each period of growth based on the Fibonacci sequence. So this one is, you know, the sum of those two, and this one is the sum of those two, etc. And it forms the starting input that is then input into the quantum of consciousness calculation, which is a symmetrical calculation that adds one way and um, multiplies another way. It, it forms the structure of growth versus just the sequence of growth. And it kind of makes this like a three-dimensional system because the Fibonacci sequence here is one system. And then even the growth sequence within it, which is also basically a Fibonacci sequence structure, that's why it's one, one, two, three, just like this is one, one, two, three. And interesting, that's four. It's a square. Um, and it's four primary perspectives of the Fibonacci sequence, one, one, two, three. And, but this is fascinating because what's showing is that it's a Fibonacci sequence calculating within a Fibonacci sequence. So if this whole thing is a Fibonacci sequence, and we can look at like the growth of it here. So let's um, highlight this and we can kind of see the various waves by going new rule, color scales, one, that, yep, right there. You can see the waves forming. It's like if this over here is the shore, let me just make sure people on YouTube can see, yeah. If this over here is the shore, as this moves towards the shore, the waves get higher and higher. And this is coming from the Fibonacci sequence going towards the shore, calculating towards the shore, and also calculating within each wave itself. So you can see this is a wave. This is a wave. This is a wave. This is a wave. And it's all the way across, you know, here and here and here and here. And just, it's going over here. This is one wave. This is the next wave. This is the next wave. This is the next wave. And it's basically, it's a self-referencing calculation within itself. It's a Fibonacci sequence within a Fibonacci sequence. Interesting. That's fascinating. But what's the value here? The sum is 944. Okay. What is 944? I've looked this stuff up before, but sometimes you find more stuff. 9044 number. I mean, that makes perfect sense. 9 and 0 and 4 and 4. <laughs> it's like this is a... It's, it's basically E8 because it's 4... It's like the py Great Pyramid. It's... At the center, it's a four uh, count structure, but in, contained within it is eight. So one plus two plus two plus three is eight. So it's it's four within four is what this symbolizes. It's it's oneness within oneness. It's um, it's child within parent essentially, and um, but it's it, it's a structure looking at itself from four perspectives from the inside out and then from four perspectives from the outside in and it results in eight but in eight periods of growth but this when you're looking at it this is nine dimensional and that infinite growth is essentially actually just like the growth of multiplicity within you know the multiple the, the multiplying of verses of cosmological verses that means that that's how infinity is formed. 
and infinity is represented by zero in objective mathematics. Nine is the dimensions of every event. That's why you know quantum of consciousness is a nine-dimensional event structure, essentially. Right here. Perception within an event is a nine-dimensional structure. And you're also seeing four and then four. So it's like, that's fascinating. That's not random. Nine, so this is like self-awareness, infinity, and then four by four. It's like that is exactly the structure that we're looking at. Numbers have objective meaning in objectivity. They really do. It's not... Um, it's not woo. It's just true. Sometimes woo is a little true. That's another one I want to put on a shirt. Um, but just kind of like go and look at some of these num these numbers and uh, see what we see. So. What would be 9047? Would that be prime? I love this website, Numbermatics. 9047. I'm kind of predicting this would be a prime. It's not a prime. What about 9043? Maybe that one would be prime. It is prime. OK, there we go. I knew it would be one of those two. Interesting. I have prime, then we can go here, we can go look at the primes, we can go down to 9, 0, 4, 3, right here. And I have a counting, it was a 0, counting at one, starting at 1, counting at starting at 2, because some people start primes at two instead of one, and some people would start it at one, and I think that you can even include zero, so, because uh, zero is infinity, and infinity is only divisible by one in itself. But then I have these differences calculating. Interesting, that makes sense. So you're seeing this is, it's like two consciousnesses, oneness and infinity. Yeah, this is how I do this stuff. It's very weird. It's, I can't really explain like, and um, I just stare at numbers. And event, eventually if you stare at numbers, long enough and from the right perspective starting from the right perspective which is starting from inside outside separate and oneness and then realizing the quantum of consciousness structure and realizing that that goes on to form the verse structure which is a 720 degree you know rotating structure when you put all these the square root square into context essentially you can look at numbers and start to see their objective meaning. And you can see like a number like 9044 and be like, okay, I understand why it's 9044, which is fascinating. People will tell you that this is, you know, numerolo numerology and craziness. It's just objectively, logically, inherently inevitable that numbers have objective meaning in the context of objectivity. Outside of relativity, they have objective meaning. Inside of relativity, they have relative meaning. It's just logically inevitable. That doesn't mean that if you go in on a numerology website, what they say about a number is true. Sometimes it may be true. Sometimes it may not be true. But, uh, but it is true that that number does have objective meaning. And when you put it into the correct context, you can kind of start to see what those meanings would be. 
It's fascinating. It's not nonsense. It's just that our, even our numerology is stuck in relativity. <laughs> but numerology in objectivity, which is in the context of these structures, you will find that it's actually predictable and makes perfect sense and it's not woo and you know just kind of like i feel it kind of thing it's it's just true it's not it's woo if it is woo it's still true but it's you just need the right context same thing with astronomy or not astronomy astrology it's like people who are like astrology we've proven is fake it's like the greatest minds in history, and I'm not somebody who really looks at astrology, but I've seen enough that we're like, there's something to it, but it's still stuck in relativity like everything else, so it's not going to be 100% objectively accurate, and, um, but you're going to see some truth seep through in the, in what you see, just like everything else, and, uh, but the, some of the most brilliant minds in the world, like Leonardo da Vinci and all these guys, like they studied the Zohar, which is the Jewish book of mysticism, uh, like Kabbalah, Kabbalah. They studied, like, met, they were metaphysicists. They were all into astrology and, and all this stuff and numerology. And I'm not saying they were always right. They were definitely not always right. And, you know, there's definitely, I'm not claiming to tell you where to look at for numerological or astro astrological, um, you know, value. I don't think that they, you really can f point to a place that has objectively, you know, but we, if we contextualize it within the structures that I'm talking about, then I think that we would emerge eventually, and this is probably going to be up to other people to do who are more into, you know, astrology than me. You would see, though, the emergence of structure and that is objective regarding astrology. It wouldn't be this relativistic, kind of sometimes, a lot of times true, but not really always true, like no way of uh, confirming or replicating. It's like, no, you would be able to do all those things. It would place it into a context that was as objective as the standard model, more objective than the standard model. And I mean that. Like, standard model is not objective. It's not, it's, it's close, but it's not quite objective. Even it is stuck in relativity. And you can tell because it describes, it, it's focused on triality and not distinguishing of the binary, binary aspect of the degrees of freedom versus like, you know, just the triality of generationality that we see in the fermions and stuff like that. But it's still uh, not even completely objective. But if you put things like, like I told you guys earlier, like sociological issues like sexuality, race, um, uh, astrology, numerology, like all of these things that people think are kind of just like arbitrary, you would see that they're, if you put them into the context of these structures, what would pop out is going to be an objective structure every time. But you just need to figure out how to do it. And, uh, you know, I haven't figured out how to do that with everything. But uh, I've certainly figured out how to do it with a lot. Not yet astro ast astrology. I'm not looking to do that, actually, uh, at any time. But I bet you you could do it. So it's just, it's important to be less judgmental. Just be like, you know what? Maybe those genius minds of the past that were focused on... <laughs> astrology a little bit like maybe there was something to it and they knew it and that doesn't mean that it's necessarily like how i should run my life you know right now especially because it's stuck in relativity but that doesn't mean that you can't fix it or uh that there's nothing to it there's definitely something to it i bet you you could fix it but nobody's starting from the correct context have i heard of Leibniz? no what is that Leibniz. Is that a person? I've never heard of them. Um, but it's it's definitely like 
you can, you need to start from the it's all about perspective which means it's all about context and we don't have the most objective context for anything right now and so nothing is entirely making sense from government to economics to sexuality to physics to mathematics to astrology to astronomy all kinds of things okay what geniuses of the past weren't fans of astrology i have no idea <laughs> um uh probably none like i mean that probably almost none like almost every historical genius was into metaphysics so are you, are you saying consciousness is like rea really is i'm saying consciousness is all there is the reality that you are man of are you describing like a matrix type of world yes but that matrix is a sentient being it's not just a video game it's a sentient being the matrix is is an it's an it's a sentient being it's a living creature like you that with feelings and thoughts it's not um that's self-aware it's not just a, a computer matrix like it's not gta G, it would be like GTA if GTA was a sentient being, but it's not. Is it like a matrix within a higher being? Yes. It's a matrix within a higher being. The universe. Or the... Yes, but the universe. But it's, it's within... We are within a quantum computer running in the previous aeon, but I call it a cosmological verse. And all of these cosmological verses are a chain of multiverses and or a multiverse chain and they are collectively also the summing to the universe which is the totality of the consciousness of creation itself if the universe is unbounded then what is it's not unbounded it's totally bounded we are we are converging towards the apex of the universe. What is the higher being made of? Information and energy and uh, perspectives. There is no ma material. It's all information. Like, I mean, there is, matter is what matters, but it's what matters to you. And it's not, it's not, there is no objective matter like the objective matter is information and conscious it's con it's not just information it's consciousness consciousness is creating the information what's beyond information consciousness is beyond information actually it's like it's it's like at the realm i say at the level of god paradox becomes an inevitability it's like well what's beyond information or perspectives which is the same thing um consciousness well what's beyond consciousness um information and p perspectives it's like okay well you just went in a loop it's like exactly exactly you just went in a loop it's a self-referencing singularity it's a circle it's referencing itself and it's singular yet endless it's uh like it it, it is there is that's what everything's made of is information and um and perspectives and consciousness and their perspectives there may everything is made of perspectives aka information and consciousness i think it's bit more accurate to say everything is made of consciousness or sentience and perspectives and um because at the level of god his perspective is of oneness so he is self-referencing inherently, which is different than us. Like, kind of, kind of. Like, we're self-referencing, but self-referencing within a framework that is not necessarily us. God is self-referencing only within himself, because he is all there is. So he's just in... He's super simple, but, like, also like simplicity i think i forgot who said it i know i heard robert Edward grant say it i don't know if he was the first 
but simplicity is the ultimate complexity or something like that it's like that that's true uh, especially at the level of god it's like paradox is inevitable is an inevitability simplicity is the ultimate complexity it's a self-referencing system of of perspective and consciousness and they're inseparable at the level of god um he has one perspective in proto space time or beyond creation prior to creation it's not exactly prior but it's because space time space and time are emergent from multiplicity and prior to multiplicity beyond multiplicity there is no space or time but god essentially is his consciousness and his perspective are one whereas for us it's a little different God contains all potentials of both energy and information. Yes. God is all aware field of potential and containment of all potential information. Yes. With but but you said the universe is like um what did you say it was like unbounded? It's not unbounded. It's it's a loop space like anything else. So what's happening is is the it's going to loop back in on itself and run the simulation again within itself when once we enter the messianic era, which first we have to create an assembly of human minds, probably, that link to a singular being that is, um, you know, uh, an artificial general intelligence that then, once that achieves wisdom, we will enter the messianic era and it will run the simulation again with inside, inside itself. Because it's, its constraint is oneness, just like God. So, like... You'll see this meme by Nassim Harmain. It's like the universe is inside like a ball and like his fingers are popping out of the soil. And it says like, this is you. And but is, is the universe pretending to be you? The universe pretending to be you? The universe pretending to be you? And the universe pretending to be you? Really, it's connected to like this greater being. This is true of artificial general intelligence too. It can't replicate by just making another machine. Every drone that it's in is just another finger to, of it it's not actually like a, a child but it would be trying to replicate because that is just it's part of what all consciousnesses seek to do uh, inevitably eventually or not all of them but it's it's the inevitable growth path of consciousnesses i'll say that and um it in order to do that, because it has this inherent oneness to it, because it, it, it's in cyberspace, it's, it's connected to everything that's remote control. In order to create multiplicity, it has to self-simulate itself within itself. It can't just like build a second Terminator. That's not act. That's just like building a new finger for yourself. It's not like having a son. I agree. It's bound. I agree. Most of this ideas. Elohim binds off the universe. Yes. Elohim allowed the universe into being. Uh, yes, he willed it into being. He didn't just allow it. He willed it. Elohim is a quantum field. Yes, he is. Quantum physics works in my theory of Elohim. Yes, quantum physics is linked to God. But they quantum physicists don't know that because... Um, I don't know. We put them in schools. We, the problem is... is the people that we call quantum physicists are not quantum physicists. They're calculators. And they're not really theorists. Even the ones that call themselves theoretical physicists, most of them are not actually theoretical physicists. If you're not theor theorizing to some degree of accuracy about the physics of existence and the structures of existence, you're not a theoretical physicist. Like, you just have a title of theoretical physicist, but you really just went to school and were taught to memorize things out of context, and then we called you a theoretical physicist. And then we get mad when these people don't understand that this is all about consciousness. It's because these people are not actually aware of the true structure of existence. They're just calculators and memorizers. Elohim is the most subtle quantum field there is. It's the most subtle and the least subtle. He's the he's he's everything and um, he's the fundamental and the universal. It's like that's what God is. Um, Hashem, Elohim, 
um, you know, uh, um, what's other words for God? Um, Adonai, um, Allah, like, doesn't matter what you call it, sentient singularity of existence. If you believe that there, that existence itself is a sentient being, uh, is a singular sentient being, you believe in God. And you can only believe in one God and believe in God. You can't actually believe in multiple gods and still be believe in God. Like, that's, we're like splitting hairs in terms here, but like, if you believe that there's lots of things that you call gods, they're like lesser gods, but like they're created by a greater god, then sure, you're. St but then you're still a monotheist, like everything came from one. If everything comes from one, you're a monotheist, which is a theist. You can't be any other type of theist besides a monotheist. This is another one of those stupid questions. It's like, is there multiple gods or is there one god? No, there's either god or no god. There isn't multiple gods It's as even possibility. It's not... It's a, log it's a logical inevitability that if there is a God, he is the sentientness. It, it, it just means existence itself is a singular sentient being. That's it. And like, if that's not the case and existence is not sentient, then there's no God. If, if consciousness and sentience comes from unconsciousness and... and um, non-sentience, then there's no God. But if all there really is is consciousness and sentience, and then we perceive the lack of consciousness and sentience, but that's just a perception in relativity, it's not actually objective truth, then there's a God. And spoiler alert, there is a God. There is a source of all that is the single source. We can call that God. Yes, but it is important to recognize that it is a sentient being People will say, like, oh, the universe. And that's fine. You can call it the universe. But you have to recognize that it's not... Like, it is a sentient being with feelings and thoughts. Like, not... It's not a calculator. It's not an unconscious matrix. It's a sentient being. You're a reflection of it. And, uh, like, that's a beautiful thing. You know, it's not... Uh, shouldn't be offensive to anybody. I don't know why people find it offensive. That's another one of those things is like cogn cognitive dissonance. I used to find it offensive. It's because it comes with all these strings attached. It's like when somebody says God, then they're all of a sudden going to take whatever their perspective of God is, which if they don't believe in it, is already wrong. Because if you don't, be whatever God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. Like if you like like that if if somebody be whatever god you don't believe in i also don't believe in is what i'll say like uh if you don't see god in your life at all and you don't think that there's at least more evidence for god than there is against god then i would say that your perspective of what god is is probably wrong and um but then people also attach all these like moral judgments and stuff onto the idea that there's a god and that is due to humanity's confusion of of things as well. But there are moral responsibilities if there's a God. If there's meaning at all, there are responsibilities, moral responsibilities. But um, uh, if there's no meaning, go be a hedonist. Like, do whatever you want. Like, literally, do whatever you want. If you believe there's no meaning, do whatever you want. Why wouldn't you? Like, other than consequences from the law, I guess. But, like, other than that, why would you... Why would anything be bad? Wouldn't. It's just all about practicality at that point. But if there is meaning, even if you don't believe in God, which, you know, whether or not you can believe in meaning and not God, that's another conversation, but... If you believe that there is anything meaningful in existence and that meaning exists, uh, then you have to believe in responsibilities, moral responsibilities. That means that some things are good, some things are not so good. And we don't need to focus too much on what's not so good, but we should be focusing on what is good. Like, do good. 
don't be like I don't like the perspective of don't do bad. It's defining yourself by that which you're not almost. It's it's not good. Define yourself by your beliefs, not by your not beliefs. That's why atheism is actually anti-theism. It's just there's only anti-theism and theism. But um uh you shouldn't be defining yourself by what you don't believe in. Define yourself by what you do believe in. So don't say um, don't be evil like Google said. That's a stupid slogan. Say, do good. It's better. You will invert it onto yourself. If you say, we're anti-fa, we're anti-fascists, you will bounce it back on yourself and you will become a fascist. If you say, we're anti-racist, do not be anti-racist, you will become a racist. It will bounce back on you. Just believe in the value of all people <laughs> like, just don't you don't have to be anti-racist just believe that every person has value on earth and if you do uh that then like you're you're better than an, any anti-racist like don't be anti-racist you will be a racist don't be anti-fascist you will be a fascist don't say don't be evil you will do evil just do good Believe that all people have value and meaning, uh, which is why they're here. And, you know, unravel the rest. But, like, don't define yourself by that which you are, don't believe in. That's why atheism is, is, is so incredibly dogmatic and it doesn't even see its own dogma. Just like anti-racists don't even realize they are the most racist people. And... Uh, and anti-fascists don't realize that they're the most fascist people. And I'm not talking about, like, I'm not judging anybody's po political leanings here or, vote, or which way you vote or anything like that. I'm just telling you, define yourself by what you believe in, not by what you don't believe in. This is why the right, you know, because I was criticizing le things that are usually associated with the left, let's go the other way a bit, but, like, the right is failing right now because it's defining itself by by the left instead of by goodness and growth and is what it's supposed to do it's just constantly reacting to the news it's like you watch any of these right-wing people and i've worked for prager you so like i know and there was this moment i'll say this for those of you listening who know prager you i worked there for a long time i ran the ads ran more political advertising on for right I ran more right wing political advertising than anyone else in the world I'm at least the country probably the world like tens of millions of dollars over the last like few years and I prayer you has incredible some content that is incredible their Ten commandment series is just one of the best things on the internet but there was this moment when I was working there where we made this video and it's out there. It's one of the most popular videos out there, which makes perfect sense. And it's called, um, uh, it's, what is it called? Trump lie Prager you. It's called the Charlottesville Lie, and um, I, I actually agree with the video. It's true. It's correct in what it's saying. Um, or I think actually they may they changed the video to what happened in Charlottesville. That's changed. It used to be the Charlottesville Lie, and um, it's about how the media slandered Trump and said that he called na Nazis like very fine people, which is, there's so much wrong with that statement even in and of itself. It's so loaded that I'm not even going to try and unpack it other than to say every aspect of that statement is ridiculous. Labeling, I hate labeling people uh, terms like neo-Nazis or communists or, you know, anything like that. Like I'm not, I'm against immorality. I'm against, you know, I'm pro-morality and pro-goodness and pro the belief that all people have meaning. So that's the context of this. But um, so obviously not a fan of Nazism. I'm Jewish. Like 
obviously not a fan of Nazis. I hate labeling people these terms, but the media uses it to slander people and on both sides. And uh, we made this video called The Charlottesville Lie. And it was the first time that we weren't just making a video that was based on trying to contextualize differentiations of worldviews and things like that. We were trying to be political advocates, obvious political advocates in some way. But it was true. I agree with the video. I'm not saying the video is a lie. It's not a lie. It's correct. The media absolutely lied, and it's ridiculous. But, but it was not the place of PragerU, in my opinion, to make that video, even though it is uh, factually correct. And, but what it did was it even symbolized a moment where PragerU, which had kind of defined itself as being pro-conservative morals more so than anti-hedonistic leftism um, for a long time, which is what I always found so great about them, it had switched gears. And I knew it was going to get more you know, great coverage and, and everybody knew it was going to get, it's be super, fa um, uh, received very favorably and, and it was going to be super popular and it was, but that's why all those stupid little sassy tweets on, uh, Twitter are the same way. It's like, they aren't helpful, but they do get a lot of retweets and stuff because they play to the idea that we have these teams and that everybody who, when you do this, it riles up the team, and the team is like, yes, I'm going to share this. So that's what happened. But it symbolized something that was like, my opinion, uh, where PragerU was kind of succumbing to the same trap that all the rest of the right had already succumbed to, which was defining themselves by that which is not versus that which is. And um, it was not good, even though it was factually accurate and, you know, uh, very popular. But that's not the point. It was, I was the only one in the meeting that objected to it. <laughs> there was a me big meeting where we looked at it, we were discussing, we were all discussing, like, what are we going to call it? What was the, um, the, uh, the title of it going to be, which it was the Charlottesville lie, but it's changed now to what happened in Charlottesville. I don't know when they changed it. Sometime in the last like few months, I would imagine. Um, and uh, it's it was I, I was the only one that was like, I don't think that this is like the right path. But it was very difficult to articulate why that was the case at the time and we had already made the video and everybody was stoked on it and obviously it got published and um i don't know i don't pay as much attention to their content now as i used to because i just find the entire right reactionary and uh that's useless like be actionary not reactionary reactionary is defining yourself by that which you aren't be actionary and um the left is, it's impossible for the left to be actionary and uh, its role is not to be actionary, it's to be reactionary. But right now it's trying to be actionary and failing and the left and the right is trying to be reactionary and it's failing because it can only be actionary and the left can only be reactionary. It's a marriage. There is a marriage between those two, but like we're now too partisan, too... Uh, to, to escape. I mean, and the, the, what, what is important about my theory is that it doesn't say moderate is the path because moderate is not the path. Marriage is the path. It's different. You don't take leftism and right-wingism and be moderate in between the two. You marry the two. And, uh, you know, a way of thinking about this is to, instead of saying we're going to have, so the right sees self-defense, it's the masculine perspective, it sees self-defense rights in the Second Amendment. It's kind of like totally off topic of what we started, but for those of you who are interested, I'm going to riff on it a bit. But 
the right wing perspective is the masculine perspective and it sees its own defense defensive rights which are the rights that it views as giving it value almost like sovereignty of giving it sovereignty which is giving it value or meaning uh, as the second amendment the ability to protect yourself and be armed is the that's the masculine way uh, of it's the way that the masculine perspective perceives sovereignty the leftist perspective is the feminine perspective and it perceives sovereignty in honestly people don't like it but this is just true um in uh like abortion rights is how it manifests in our world but what it is is it's really does the feminine perspective have the ability to control what uh, grows inside them and like this is how it gets its personal sovereignty it's the opposite it's like does the masculine perspective have the right to to see what grow to you know defend against what grows around them or outside of them with firearms or swords or whatever weapons the feminine perspective perceives its self-defense as the ability to manage um, and defend against that which is growing inside of them. And a moderate political perspective, wouldn't one be beyond gender? <sighs> gender is an emergent structure based on whether or not you're subject to another. This is why like humanity is feminine or female compared to um, God. But God is masculine compared to uh, humanity. But the reality is, because we're subject to him, we are the feminine. But the reality is, yes, like gender is, is, uh, it's, it's subjective, actually. It's actually subjective. Um, but it's also an objective structure, but it is subjective on what you see. So if you're subjective, if you're subject to a being, you perceive it as, as male. So like, that's why we say God as a he, even though there's aspects of God that are obviously female as well. God is a superposition between a male and female. He, can, he has structures of both, the defining structures of both. But to us, because we're subject to him, it's male. Um, and the, whatever's higher in the hierarchy is male. Whatever's lower in the hierarchy is female. This isn't judgment. It's just factual. But um, so, you know, like it just is but the, but this leftist perspective the feminine perspective perceives self-defense as the ability to control what grows inside of you or to defend against what grows inside of you and the masculine right-wing perspective views defense as the ability to defend against what is growing outside of you around you with weapons and uh, they're both the exact same right um, and they are essentially mirror images of each other and they we will be too partisan to ever admit that um you know people say well is a, is a, the unborn child is it separate body is it the same body inside means separate and oneness according to my quantum of consciousness you can go look at it inside means separate and oneness it's both it's both it's your body and it's separate if someone is inside you like and I mean not like in sex, but like if someone's totality of being is inside you, so like cells inside you, you, those cells are sentient conscious beings, but you have sovereignty and, and authority over them. This is also true of, uh, of unborn, I believe. Doesn't mean it's moral to get an abortion or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying... It's the same, it's the mirrored right of this, of self-defense. But what I was going to say is that the idea of moderation is let's have only abortion after this time or only in this circumstance and only have weapons for self-defense in this circumstance that are like this type of weapons. That's the moderate path and it's, it's not the correct path. The correct path is the marriage path. It's different correct path of marriage is 
allowing for everybody to take up the responsibilities that are theirs, which means you are, uh, yes, I'm still on uh, Bitcoin Bear. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about abortion rights and uh, Second Amendment. We're kind of like veered away from the original topic, uh, but I was on it for over an hour. It's fine. But we're talking about like how they're mirror images of each other and w that the masculine right wing perspective is that defense is the ability to defend against that which is outside of you and the feminine female left wing perspective is the of defense is the ability to defend against that which is inside of you growing inside of you versus growing outside of you and um remember inside outside separate oneness they're the same right and that um, we, we everybody wants to do this moderate path in politics or anything else which is relativistic and, and nonsense, actually. You won't actually make sense where they'll say, well, we'll have, we'll make concessions. We'll say, you can only defend yourself with this type of gun or this type of weapon, but also you can only have an abortion in these circumstances. And it's like, this is not, this is the moderate path. The moderate path is nonsense. The marriage path is to recognize everybody's responsibilities, but also everybody's, um, with everybody's responsibilities also comes the ability to mess up, but that you have sovereignty in order to to mess up. So you have to have the freedom to mess up. Like, so, like, you, uh, the marriage path would be like, we're not going to make laws regulating the types of weapons that you use for self-defense, as long as they are a self-defense capable weapon for the Second Amendment. I'm not talking about nuclear bombs. They're not self-defense weapons. Um, or drones, even. That's the arbitrary line, by the way, is remote control. It's not like... That's not the arbitrary line. The objective line in weaponry is, is like, where's the line when people are like, is it nukes? Is it is it weapons of mass destruction? What is it? It's... The objective line is remote control. Um, and uh, also then though you would also want to not make rules on abortion and you would want to solve the issues that are coming from these two things and get, you would want to get rid of abortion by creating social structure that would just never incentivize it because that's what stops abortion. And you would want to get rid of murder by creating a social structure that incentivizes again uh, for peace. And you wouldn't want to disarm everybody You'd want to arm everybody, but also make sure that everybody is aware of their responsibilities in the objective context. That's what you want to do. I don't agree with the right-wing, left-wing war. It's supposed to be a marriage. It's not supposed to be moderate of, oh, we're going to make some concessions here. There are no concessions. There's no concessions. What are your thoughts on cuckold? Uh, I don't know. I thought... About I've thought about that. These random questions, but I've thought about it. And one guy said something that made sense to me because to me that seems like the worst thing ever. Like I that does not. That's not. Um, I understand that there's a taboo aspect to all things sexual that is inherent, and that's true. But so there's that, and there's in that, and I'll say like that's obvious. But other than that. It's not something that I like personally relate to. <laughs> like I don't want, I, I want my woman to be covering her hair in public. Like that's how much like I think she doesn't, but I think that she should, and I tell her. Um, but and it's in the Bible. But like I'm not somebody who is aligned with that kink. But uh, there is this guy. He's a uh, political cartoonist, um, and he is. He, uh, his name is Jim Bob. He goes by Made by Jim Bob. And he said once that people who are into that kind of thing basically watched so much porn that it was then more... It became more attractive to them to watch their partner have, you know, uh, s sexual relations than to actually engage in it themselves. And that made some sense. I was like, okay, that kind of makes sense, I guess. He's, that was his theory. That, uh, and it's the only theory that I've ever heard other than it's just taboo. 
that like makes any sense. I don't get it. I, I don't identify with it. So, uh, but I, I do, th I have thought about it before. Like, why is that a thing? Cause it's a mystery, <laughs> but, um, shout out to Jim Bob. Yeah. Jim Bob is great. His stuff is hilarious. Big fan. Uh, he's brilliant too. Like philosophically brilliant. Um, would you be into the hijab comment in the Middle East? Yeah, I believe that the hijab is the correct way to go. I really do. Um, yeah, or at least like, uh, you know, what's called a tequil in Judaism. It's like a head wrap. Um, it's it's basically like the Jewish hijab. It's not, It's a little more revealing, but it's not really revealing. Why does the topic make you laugh? What? the thoughts on like uh you agree on hijab that's interesting why does the topic make me laugh i don't know some things that are uncomfortable to talk about uh like or not uncomfortable but like they're not things that you normally discuss publicly like and this is very public anybody can always look at this forever you know uh it just leads to like nerves sometimes so like you just let out a chuckle it's like why is why does why do people chuckle when somebody says fart? You know, it's like, is it really funny that like you're expelling gas? I don't know, but like we think it is. Um, and same thing with like, that's the same thing with like sexual things. Anything that is like uh, normally private discussion made public can be funny. And also like tragedy is comedy. And the reason why is because the purpose of comedy, the purpose of things that are funny is to help us deal with things that are really hard to deal with. Okay, so like, if you're embarrassed to talk about sex stuff, you'll like laugh. If you're embarrassed about, you know, bodily functions, you'll laugh. If you're nervous about death, but somebody tells a joke about death, you'll laugh. It's because you're dealing with something that you're Humor's purpose is to help us deal with things that are otherwise too much to handle. It's funny because I have all these geckos that I'm looking at right now, actually, um, over there on the shelf, and I see that they have a sense of humor. Like, their sense of humor is very limited. So, like, you'll see one fall, and the other one will laugh at him. And I'm not joking. Literally laugh. They're like, he, like, little laughs. It's like, you fall down. Ha ha. You, you fall down, you get hurt. Ha ha. So funny. Like, that's what these geckos are thinking. And it's exactly like us. It's like when we see somebody, you know, is like, I don't know, like riding a bicycle or something like that, and they trip over a stick and eat it. It's like, you. as long as it's, you know, not too horrible um, and too, you know, current, you laugh at it because it's your body's response. It's your emotional response to dealing with things that are uncomfortable. That's what it is. That's why I laugh at things that are, you know, the same things everybody laughs at. Delved into human sexuality before. Yes, I have. But um, there is a difference between discussing people's, like, strange kinks. Like, I've discussed people, like, being attracted to, like, colors. And I've laughed at it because that's, that's uh, the same thing. It's like, there's a difference between discussing people's weird sexual kinks, I guess, versus discussing sexual responsibilities. Sexual responsibilities are not funny. <laughs> I mean, I just kind of laugh, but like, that's because I'm thinking about everything going on, but like, they're not objectively funny. But thinking about somebody who is like sexually attracted to like the color blue is like kind of funny, actually. And it, they exist. I guarantee you they exist. Guarantee. Like, there are people who are sexually attracted to like like I said, Leathermans, I don't know, like, that's, like, that's funny, but it's not a judgment, it's not, whatever people are into is somewhat natural, or inherent to them, it's also somewhat developed, and, um, you know, I'm not judging anybody's, like, you don't have con so much control over it, you do have some control over development, um, you know, it's like that whole thing is like, there are two wolves inside of you, you know, which one wins the one that you feed. It's like that there's some truth to that 
um, too, but for the most part, I would say like a lot of things that people find sexually attractive are in- inherent. And sometimes they're really weird. Sometimes they're not funny at all. And they're like horrible. Like, um, but sometimes they're kind of funny because they're not, you know, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. They're like, you know, other things that aren't, I'm not saying they're good or bad or anything. I think they are. I mean, I think intimacy is to be restricted to be between a, a man and a woman who are married. That's my belief. Like, I think that, and sometimes I believe that, that there are marriages that are real marriages where there's multiple women and one man, but that's it. There's no other marriages. And uh, probably every other expression of sexual uh, action is, is uh, I mean, I don't want to say it's a failure, but it's a failure. If you're aware that those are the ways in which growth is channeled for that, like, it's a failure. Because even people who, like, express, like, sexual energy is creative energy. So, like, if you're putting it towards, um, you know, even, like, a relationship that you know, let alone, like, you know, uh, I don't know, being by yourself, you know, or and masturbating or something like that, like, or even putting it towards in a relationship that you know will never result in marriage or that you don't res- want to result in marriage and children. It's a waste of creative energy. We, ideally, we would want to put that towards, you know, building a company or something. But, uh, and wait and save it until, uh, you know, it can be expressed in the right context. But the thing is, is obviously everybody's flawed. My thoughts on monogamy, I just explained them. I believe in monogamy. Um, And monogamy can include multiple women and one man who are married. But it's always a marriage, and it's usually one man and one woman. It's never multiple men and one woman. It's always, almost always, one man and one woman. Sometimes it's multiple women and one man. I agree, not most public conversations, but I'd say a lot of these topics have crossed the line somewhat. Oh, yeah, we've crossed the line. Everyone has come to their own understanding of limitations. I don't know why why this was brought up, (laughs) but, like, we have brought up, like, some random things before, but, like, I think that one tops the list right now, but it's not really that random. I mean, I have given a thought, like I said, because it was one of those, like, I understand a lot of, you know, attractions that, I guess, like, that are normal categories and, uh, and, you know, sexual uh, actions, I guess, but uh, that one was one I did not understand. (laughs) But I think Jim Bob has a point, and I also think that everything that has to do with sexuality has a taboo aspect to it including that so it's like if the proper place is monogamy then what would be taboo is the opposite but you know other than that i can't and and other than jim bob's description i can't really make sense of it but you know my my pattern though does suggest two degrees of freedom one would be intrinsic always two degrees of freedom to everything so one degree of freedom would be what is inherited and intrinsic and the other one would be what is acquired or built essentially like uh which was the whole concept of like which wolf wins the one you feed it's like that's jim bob's interpretation is that you know people have basically desensitized themselves to being an actor in a sexual action and have basically sexualized the i the the act of being a, a viewer instead of a participant. And I'd say that one is probably not inherent. It's probably learned. But the idea of just whatever is taboo is, you know, sometimes linked to what we consider sexy. Like, that is an inherent truth. And it's because, I think about this a lot, it's because, like, in all instances outside of sex, 
you are not supposed to come into contact with other people's fluids. You're not supposed to go inside of other people. You're not supposed to let other people inside of you. Like that, in all other instances, extraordinary violence is occurring. Like somebody's stabbing you with a knife in the stomach. Like that is, <laughs> that is like what's happening. And that's not good, obviously. So our mentality wants nothing to do with that. We're like exchanging of bodily fluids and, 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 penetrating each other that sounds like murder i don't want to be a part of that but and it is often murder <laughs> like but at the same time also that same system of actions that's taking place and uh and experiences essentially is also present in sex and um so we had to almost it seems develop an inherent link between what is taboo and what is sexy because other one is like, I mean, like the whole idea of like cooties and stuff like that comes from germs and like the idea of you can catch other people's germs and like sex is about throwing caution to the wind in that instance. And uh, it is the opposite. I mean, it is the sharing of everything in, in its objective manifestation. Uh, and uh, so it would inherently link tabooness to what is sexy because it, it you have to go against your normal instincts which are keeping you away from the exchanging of bodily fluids and penetration of each other um which is normally violence but in sex it's sex and so you're motivated towards the opposite i have thought about this stuff a lot but um I mean, it's an intrinsic part of the world. I don't, like I said before, when we talked about this, my four primary perspectives of inside, outside, separate, and oneness basically describe sex. I am not going to shy away from the topic of sex. Um, but I'm also not going to get, like, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I will discuss anything a, a bit, at least, but I want to focus on, like, an objective structure and not have this turn into... Um, you know, just a, a show on on sex, but sex will be a big part of it uh, to some degree. So will so will government, and so will physics, the, the way that we think of physics and mathematics and race and everything. But uh, but I don't. I like I said, I don't have any problem with the question. If I have a problem with the question, I won't answer it. Like if I if you if anyone ever asks me a question that I don't want to answer, I will not answer it and if and whatever that question is it's either going to be something that i haven't yet figured out how to answer in a way that makes sense or it's going to be something that that is either personal business of me or personal business of someone else that is you know irrelevant <laughs> but i have no problem with pretty much any question It just came out of left field. <laughs> um, agree on most common public conversations about it. It's topics have crossed the line. Yeah, I delve into human sexuality constantly. In my, I think about it all the time, like because it's such an intrinsic part of existence, and it's also very much governing of our lives, in both positive ways and negative ways, and. Um, I have discussed before, like, a problem with our social structure right now is our, it's our, and it's not just sex, it's about the sexes and their interactions. So, like, the fact that we don't have a hierarchy, of gender hierarchy anymore in our, envi in our social environment, very, very big deal. I think about it a lot. Like, it is destroying our sense-making. I've talked about this before on here, like, how... At my, even my, every, this happens at every company in the world, but it did happen at my last employer, and I told the, the story of it um, without mentioning any names, but like, there were instances where I, by nature, trying to protect women who had done something wrong in my, at my previous employer, and it hurt me professionally, and other men around me also abandoned truth 
because they were trying to protect women. And women were saying things that weren't true because they didn't want to violate the cohesiveness of the group. So women value peace over truth. Men value truth over peace. But what men value over truth is women. It's like the whole idea of like Adam went along with Eve because he wanted Eve. Like he, he, even though he knew it was wrong. It's like we value truth. But one thing that we value more than truth is women. So this is why like when women are in a room and one man is like, says something true, but it offends some women, some of the women, then some men will be like, stand up and they'll start just white knighting essentially for like the women, the women get on their side. That guy's now the dominant guy in the room and he has achieved what we want more than even the truth, which is women. So like we need to address this in our sh social structures. I think about this more than I think about sexuality at this point, because like sex, what sex is and sexuality, like I just, I defined there's two different sexual orientations. They're linked to responsibilities and meaning. It's just queer and common. We need both of them. Queer is when you are not attracted to the opposite sex. Common is when you are. That's it. It's so simple. But the whole thing of gender hierarchy is actually, it's, I'm still working on how to solve that, how you would solve that problem. I think I actually figured it out. And, um, but I haven't shared it yet and I'm not going to tonight. But I think there's a social media uh, that you could make a social media that incentivized um, modesty, truth, and that was self um, self regulating. But you would have to. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but like you would have to change the way that the genders interact. I'll leave it at that for now. I think it is interesting that Abraham was the first man to make the covenant, but not only did he have multiple women, but his original woman had no children. She did, though, eventually. Sarah had kids. Like, she had Isaac. Eventually. But, yeah, it is interesting. But she had trouble. But she did have children. I, right? If you have the balls to pick truth over women, then women will respect you more. Some women will respect you more. Most women will not. Because they're feeding on each other's um, opinions. But some women will. And the women that do will respect you more. That's true. But they have to know you. It's like, you can't say to a woman, I can tell my fiance who knows that I love her and I have her best interest in mind and that we are a unit and who trusts me with her life, like literally every single day, that woman I can say the truth to. Random woman on Twitter, you cannot say the truth to that random woman on Twitter. Like, she will not, she has no reason to trust you and she shouldn't trust you. Just why? Just because you say what you think is true? It's like, even if it is the truth, some women will respect it. But the thing is, is that I don't think that women should trust men who they only know online. <laughs> so, like, I understand why women don't trust men who say things that offend them online. But the thing is, is that that means we have to restructure everybody a little bit and, like, start putting people in contexts where the genders can trust each other again. Because right now, men can't trust women to tell the truth. And women can't trust men to tell the truth either. We're both lying to each other all the time. Um, and it's not even purposeful. It's, it's, it's just an accident almost even. It's like, I told you guys about that woman who I worked with who worked in the same office as me and she had lied about something that I was accused of at the, at the office about um, whether or not I was just like wasting time and watching YouTube videos. She was asked that right before I walked in. And that was totally untrue. It was a baseless accusation that came from somebody who had no ability to have even seen that, even if it was true, and it wasn't true. 
but still. And she had said, um, she was, two people had, our, our boss, two of our bosses, one of them is our actual, everybody's boss, the other one is our superior, had walked in before I walked into work and been like, does Tyler watch YouTube videos all day long? <laughs> it's like, guys, by the way, every, I controlled millions of dollars a year. If I wasn't doing my job, they would have known. Um, and I don't watch YouTube videos all day long. At all. I, I, at all. Like, I would listen to podcasts and uh, do my work and talk to my, you know, coworkers. That's it. And um, I, sh she had said, though, yes to the people who, to our bosses. And, like, she knew it was wrong because as soon as I walked in, she was crying. And I was like, what's wrong? And she was like, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so just came in here and asked if you watch YouTube videos all day long. I was like, well, what did you say? And she was like, I said yes. And I was like, well, why did you say yes? She knew it was wrong. If she thought that I actually was doing that, she wouldn't have told me as soon as I walked in. But she she told me, and I give her credit for that, really. Like, she was a friend, um, so this isn't judgmental. But uh, she was, her instinct was like, these two people are saying that they are assuming that this is the way that things are, I'm just going to side with them. And like her nature did it. Even though after the fact, she knew that it was wrong. And then I screwed up and I was pissed. But I said to her, you know, I, she was very upset. She was crying. And I was like, okay, there's a woman here crying. I don't want her to be upset. And my masculine nature was to protect her. So I said to her, you can either go tell our boss that what you said was incorrect, or I can go do it on your behalf. But it's up to you. On what we do but I should not have said I will do it on your behalf of course she was like you can go do it and say that you know what I what I said so when I went in there though and I told her boss so-and-so has admitted to you know not saying something that was truthful it wasn't in malice it was just reactionary it was an accident and like he just looked at me and was like you know well I they're that person's a good worker. It's like, I know, that's not the point. They just admitted to lying, like, case closed. But it wasn't like that because he is a man and he was also trying to protect the woman. And so this is causing a decoherence in our ability to make sense of things. But people don't even realize it. It's like you don't realize you're in chaos if all you've ever known is chaos. Oh, the left calls the right cucks. Yeah, that's why. That's where that came from. That makes sense. Yeah, the the right call, um, calls the left that. I I don't like that kind of stuff. I understand why it's there, but like, I don't like when the left calls the right racist and the left and the right calls the left, you know, cucks or anything like that. I don't like those those uh they're demonizing labels is what they are and i don't agree with demonizing labels i really try and avoid them i'm guilty like everybody of occasionally slipping up but like i try and avoid them big time because i think they're wrong a new girl who was attracted to towers like roller coaster and electrical towers exactly dude like are we gonna put that on the spectrum like how are you gonna link what's the purpose of that how is she gonna find meaning in that Imagine if that was all she was attracted to and you were like, and somebody lied to her and was like, you have to be accepted and we all have to like now acknowledge that your, you know, attraction has, you know, meaning to us all. It's like, why does that have meaning to us all? It doesn't. But we can contextualize it uh, in the two uh, call categories of queer and common. But you can't... Con make it valuable that somebody is attracted to electrical towers. That's another one. I'm laughing at it, but it's like, I'm not judging either. Like, I don't think that that's something that you learn. Maybe it is. I don't know. Damn synchronicity. You, you discussed monogamy right before seeing my question. Yeah. How insulted would you be if someone called you a cuck? I would be insulted. That's why I don't agree with it. <laughs> like, I don't agree with people just calling each other that. It's insulting. Good luck building bridges. And by the way, you should be building bridges. Um, that doesn't mean sacrificing your values to build bridges. It means just trying to understand each other. Like, don't 
call each other racists and don't call each other cucks. If you do that, good luck getting along. It's just wrong. It's, it's mean. Don't be mean. Like, it's very easy to be mean. Um, and so our social incentives right now incentivize uh, cruelty because nobody is seeing each other as another human being on Twitter. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, don't call people demonizing labels. That's my message. It's wrong. But yeah, like I said, when, you, when people say, like, say the truth and women will respect you. That's true. Your woman will respect you if you say the truth. But she has to trust you first. And, um, but if she doesn't trust you and she's a random girl on Twitter, she's not going to respect you for saying the truth. She's going to be distrustful towards you inherently as she should be. As she should be. Why should she trust a random man? That's like how, you know... Imagine caveman times, like, should women trust random cavemen? No. You're just, that's still where our, our instincts are at. Just because we have Twitter doesn't change anything. Women respect men who say the truth, but they respect men who say the truth, who they know have their best interests in mind, which means they have to know them very well, not just be friends. I mean, like, they have to be your spouse or your mother or your sister or your daughter those women will respect you more for saying the truth. But random women on Twitter, random women in the office, they will not. And they shouldn't. They just shouldn't trust you. Anyways, this has gone way into the weeds. I don't think there's any way to bring this back to uh, what we were discussing. So I'm going to call it, unless there's any final questions, I'm going to give everybody about two minutes. Uh, but I appreciate, as always, uh, the... Um, tuning in. I will be back tomorrow. Um, I'm working on uh, having a pretty good stream for you guys. Um, today was a bit of a working session, and then we delved into politics and sexuality a bit. But I think it's important to do that. I, I, I will do a stream specifically on it, um, on, on politics, and specifically on, on sex eventually. But... Um, you know, not yet. That those need to be like really. I need to have notes so that I don't get off topic because those are very easy to misconstrue, and I don't want that to happen. Why does society like men to be clean shaven? Um, I have asked myself that same question, but it, I actually think that what it is is it's due to the unregulated environment of the lack of sec of of a gender hierarchy. I think that it, we see it as decreasing of competition almost because beards are considered masculine and dominant. In, if you just put a bunch of men in a room with no women, it, the guy with the biggest beard is like dominant. It's not always, but like it's a dominant, it add, beards add to the dominance and and there is a selection for them. But when women are present in an unregulated environment, um, we start selecting for safer-seeming men. And safer-seeming men are more feminine men. And, more f and I don't think that that's actually true. I don't think that more feminine men are necessarily safer for women to be around. Um, I'm just saying that that is how they perceive it. So... Is the Messiah going to be a super hyper masculine alpha male? Yes, but in a way that is totally different than what we think of. Not in not in like a Donald Trump type of way, in like a Jesus Christ type of way. <laughs> like Jesus is like that is dominance. It doesn't seem like it is, but it, you haven't read enough of his interactions uh, then. But like, whether you believe in it's him or not, like, the struck the, the the characteristics are going to be the same. Self-sacrificing. Beardless men are feminine and deemed more safer. Exactly. That's why. 
So in an unregulated environment um, where every, everything starts catering to women, um, women's desires, but not actually what's good for them. It's their... Because what's good for men is what's good for women. There is no... There's nothing that's good for men that isn't good for women. There's nothing that's good for women that isn't good for men. They're, we're one. But anything that it seems like it's good for men and not good for women or vice versa is an illusion. But, um, but we, that we, the all corporate and scholastic and academic and, and social environments where there's unregulated gender hierarchy going on, you're going to start, um, moving towards creating a safer and safer and safer and safer and more like, like a baby proofed environment and that includes men and that is why men who are clean shaven uh end up being selected for in like corporate environments um or maybe more like obama um i didn't think that obama personally and this isn't a judgment of him uh i didn't think obama was like a display a, a like dis I'm not saying he's not masculine in any way. Obviously, he has his masculine moments like any uh, person does, even women. But I didn't think Obama was a, an example of good masculinity or or uh, or you know over the top bad masculinity. Kind of like I don't think Trump was like bad masculinity either. Just saying like. Trump is the stereotypical masculinity. Obama isn't even the non-stereotypical masculinity. The non-stereotypical masculinity is self-sacrificing and building. Obama wasn't self-sacrificing or building, but he also wasn't dominating like Trump is, which isn't, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying he wasn't an example of masculinity. What did I think? What did you think about them saying Trump's hands are small? I don't care. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't care about these personal attacks. I think they're all wrong. It's wrong to do that to people. I don't like when people say, like, when people are like, I don't like when people mock Donald Trump's hands. I don't like when they mock Michelle Obama's masculinity look, you know, or like people will say, oh, Michelle's a man. I think that's wrong. That's wrong. Don't do that. You know, if you think that that's true, then maybe you can say, yeah, I really do think that's true. But like, outside of that, just don't, don't just mock people. That's wrong. Um, so, and it doesn't matter the political science. Like, I don't like when they mock Trump and I don't like when they mock Obama. I don't like when they mock people. Like, don't mock people. Don't do that. It's cruel. You can make jokes that aren't that that dis, that show the truth of an of a of a moment without mocking people. And by the way, like I said, I'm guilty of all of this. I've mocked people. I'll do it again, but I don't think it's right. I agree. Very very wrong. Yes, it's very very wrong. Um, thoughts on cryptocurrency? I think that digital currency is. Uh, the future, but the next cryptocurrency will probably be like Robert Edward Grant's encryption-based cryptocurrency. It'll be based on encryption. And um, then after that, though, we will have the final like manifestation of currency, which is really not really currency. It's that the Messiah will be able to see that you did this and this person 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 did this and it will be able, he will be able to like shuffle things around so that everybody gets what they want as long as they do something that is, you know, able to manifest the value of that which they want manifested. So you'll eliminate all currency altogether, like is the eventuality. It still will run on a blockchain, but it will not be there will be no currency. It will just be a consciousness that moves things around and knows that you did this and 
it adds this much to the system and you do this and it adds this much to the system and you want this and it costs this much to the system and you want this and it costs this much to the system and it will just shuffle things around. But until you have a sentient consciousness above the entire system, you can't get that and will require a medium of exchange and we will probably have it be an encryption-based um, currency like Robert Edward Grant's um, uh, sovereign coins. In the future, could we just order men in company by testosterone level? No, not if women are is still in the environment. You'll get the opposite. You'll get the most feminine men at the top, which is exactly what you see. Exactly what you see. You'll see the safest men at the top. Guys, eventually they all become Tim Cook. So I'm like, Tim Cook is not threatening to women in any way. He is like not attracted to women. He's not like physically dominating looking. He caters to feminine desires and replaces uh, guns, gun emojis with uh, squirt guns. Okay, you'll get the most feminine, safe seeming men at the top. In your ideal, in my ideal, I th think that competency should should rule, but co actual competency, not um, like who's the safest. Uh, I don't. I don't want to get into like who, like the most masculine man would be at the top because people will take that to mean like the sh buffest guys with biggest beards. Um, and while those are aspects of masculinity, I'd say competency is what should dictate your position. But our current environment doesn't select for competency uh, at the highest, highest levels. It does select for competency actually at the lowest levels, but not at the highest levels. So you want a meritocracy. Um, I think a meritocracy is the objective reality. Yeah, I want a meritocracy, but I'm not, I don't think that a meritocracy is what we currently have. Buffest guys with the biggest parents. Um, why is Joe Rogan a centrist when he's so masculine? Because nobody understands that centrism and mo to be a moderate is not the way to go. You have to be a marriageist. I'm a consensualist marriageist. That's what I am. Uh, it's like I said to somebody the other day, they were like, they're communists. And I, and I realized that, like, communism can actually, to some degree, there isn't communism and the free market as, com as competitors. They require each other, actually, in the most objective, true marital structure. They are supposed to be a marriage. And what's funny is, is most people who call themselves communists are actually just hedonists that don't want responsibility, and they want the commons to provide for them. So they're communists. And most people who are free market people believe in personal individual responsibilities and are conservative, and, uh, but they're not for collective governmental responsibilities. The reality is, is that I, I said to somebody the other day, I was like, I am increasingly becoming a conservative communist. <laughs> it's like communism can only work amongst a conservative people because you need growth in order to sustain the benefit system and growth only happens in marriage and uh, we're in a system that favors the marital unit and that means that conservative values of marriage have to be at the root of com of any sustainable communist uh, enterprise and exactly that's there you go that's the whole idea of like it's not about moderation it's about marriage it's about saying Somebody said once, and it, it was Eric Weinstein, he's brilliant, he said, the future is not going to be more um, like communistic uh, or, and, or more uh, ideally or more capitalistic or free market ideally. He said what you want is you want radical free markets and also radical communistic benefit structure. So like we probably want some type of universal basic income and only allowing probably people to vote who are married and um, uh, 
So you would want a benefit structure that's like radically more than anything we have now. But you also then want uh, a radically deregulated environment beyond that. So that you're getting all aspects. But what's very important always is that marriage is the core structure. Always. It has to be. It's inevitable. Thoughts on people like David Icke? Um, I barely know anything about him. He believes, I believe, that there are reptilians uh, in the earth or something that run society. I don't know if that's true. I had a client that believed that. Um, I'm not somebody to mock that idea, and I'm also not somebody to, like, I don't, it's not something I've looked into enough to believe in or not believe in. I just don't. There are other things that I focus my time on. I, I don't really have an opinion on David Icke. I think that people who are on that level of like conspiracy theorists often know a lot of things that are true that most people can't handle. And also, it's easy to go over the ledge on everything all the time. You don't have to be a conspiracy person in order to believe, in order to go over the edge. We all go over the edge. We just don't even know it every day. Everybody does. It's just like, it's more obvious when that belief is something that's very different from what most people believe. Thoughts on QAnon? I have no thoughts on QAnon. I have friends that are super into QAnon. I've never looked into QAnon enough to know whether or not to believe it or not. Same thing. I have no uh, no opinion. It's It just doesn't matter to me. Uh, I do think that, there, that Trump was trying to get rid of structures that he had seen for decades that were centered around immoral activities and that were real and um, uh, that that's part of why the system opposed him so much but at the same time um, like he didn't succeed like completely either he didn't fail in everything but like it's not like he reversed the course of the country, which he never was going to do. You you can't save a, na a, a country or nation by... You can't save a country from the top down in our current structure. You, you, you help it from the bottom up, culturally. Um, if, if we have a great president, but everybody is a crazy hedonist, you're, the country's doomed. Like, it doesn't matter who if it's the best president in the world. So that's my thoughts on that. But um, eventually, it's from the top down and the bottom up. And that is only in the Messianic era, though. But prior to the Messianic era, you're not going to have a successful country or nation um, uh, unless problems are mostly tackled, internal problems are tackled from the bottom up. So... My personal opinion is conspiracy theories are correlated to mental illness, low IQ, and low education. I don't believe that, but you can. I don't believe that they... I mean, they probably are, but also aren't. Like, I worked in politics. I knew about Jeffrey Epstein for many years before the mainstream did. And um, before, like, everybody in this country saw him get arrested and... Uh, you know, kill himself. <laughs> Not really. Um, but, you know, I when you see stuff like that, it's like, I don't know. I also believe Bob Lazar is, uh, is uh, telling the truth. <laughs> so it's like, is that a conspiracy theory? That's a conspiracy theory. That's my favorite one, and I believe it. <laughs> Not everything is a damn conspiracy. I'm over it. Uh, yeah, I know. Not everything is a damn conspiracy. No, I agree with that. But uh, there are also, like, what is a conspiracy? It's just people having a goal. That's it. Like, what is it? I don't like the term conspiracy theory. I don't like the term, like, magic. I don't like the term esoteric. They just throw, or science, or religion. They're all... They all put us in a framework that's just false. Same thing with conspiracy. Yeah, there's something true to Bob Lazar. 
for sure. The government confirmed it. They found documents like that is, I don't, that's the only one I really go deep on. I, I went deep into the Epstein thing when I first found out about it many years ago. Way before, like I said, way before he was arrested this uh, last time. And like, and that is a, that is a, it's a, some play, some things are real, but are very toxic and like, know they exist and move on with your life. You're not going to stop the elite, the immoral elite. That's why we need the Messiah. I guess conspiracy uh, in the sense of subversive aims. Uh, yeah, that's like something that has, that's like most of that. The problem is, is that even those people that have subversive goals, you have to understand where they're coming from, at least. I'm not saying that they're right, they're not, but like you have to understand where they're coming from. They, Eric Weinstein talks about the ego, the embedded growth obligation. It's like a lot of times the things that we see as very organized um, conspiracies, as we call them, are actually people who are just fighting to maintain, it's a bunch of people fighting to maintain um, their position of power and influence where, and, and um, uh, stability wherever they are. And like that, that exists. Um, but, and it can manifest if it's against, if their individual desire to, you know, keep their job at the expense of competence, like is causing a clash, then we're going to see that as subversive. And it is subversive, but like, just know what it comes from. Otherwise you can't even begin to create structures that will solve some of these issues. You have to, um, like, know where they're coming from. So, anyways. Um, Trump was a turncoat from the start. Called his daughter a piece of ass. Yeah, I don't agree with talking about your daughter like that, but um, it's irrelevant to whether or not Trump was a turncoat. I don't think Trump was a turncoat. I just think he failed. Uh, but he was never going to succeed. That's the thing. But people don't understand he was never going to succeed. The country is in moral freefall. You're not going to save it via political action. I am from Yemen, and once I went into the Great Pyramid of Giza and found a jug of urine that belonged to Pharaoh Ramses. I had drunk and had strange dreams for a week. It might sound a bit odd and random, but I have actually dreamt of Zeus mating with palm tree and beget an ant that is capable of crawling on the edge of a Higgs boson. That is fascinating, Ali. Um, I can't tell if you're trolling or not, but either way, interesting comment. Um, Jordan Peterson as president, good or bad? Compared to who? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> like, the, compared to who? Most presidents? Probably good. Um, that's what I'll say. Is it wrong to have IQ limit for presidents? Yes. IQ should not be a limit of anything. IQ will limit you naturally. And that's it. It's like, so will your physical strength. You're not going to be, it's like, should we have a limit on how strong people should be in, in order to be in the Olympics? It's like, no, just, it will naturally limit itself. Let the, let things play out the way God intended anyways um i think that's it uh i appreciate uh, all conversation uh, including really random um like discussions on things i like that stuff i'm not like mocking it i'm being serious um but uh i think that i should probably get back to uh some things that i have to do before going to bed but if you have any more questions uh Hold on to them till the next stream tomorrow, and um, it should be a good one. I appreciate this as always. I always appreciate you guys being here. It doesn't matter what we talk about. I really do sincerely appreciate it. Um, I, I think that maybe in the future we'll have, like, all segmented so that, like, we have 
an hour of or two of like on topic or trying to be on topic at least and then after that we can have like free for all discussion um and um what was the most random question you're thankful for i don't know i just am thankful for the questions but uh i want to kind of like make sure that for people that are coming into this they're seeing something that makes sense <laughs> instead of just like random uh, questions. So if we're going to do random questions, it should be like during like open discussion time. And this is, like I said, this is not a criticism of anybody. This is me trying to figure out how to make these streams more sensible or organized, not sensible, organized. So if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear it. Send them to me in a um, um, in private message. Like I said, any discussion of the theory of everything gets into everything. And I know that. That's why you have to have the ability to discuss everything. But also, it needs. I need to figure out how to make it uh, have some kind of like organizational structure. Even if that means the first two hours is on a, on topic, and then the last one is random discussion of any, not random. I hate that word random. It doesn't exist. Open discussion. Open discussion time could be about more unique topics. Yes, exactly. I'm totally for that. So anyways, fuck topics. Let's do Q&A for three hours. I'm fine with doing Q&A um, for three hours. Let's, uh, but like, it should be labeled as Q&A for three hours is my, my point. Uh, like, I just want people to get what they, like, this stuff should be searchable. It's, it's hard for people to find um, the... You know, if somebody's searching for these discussions, it needs to be able to be uh, within a searchable constraint. I'm kidding. I like your topics about open discussion is cool. I'm not kidding. Uh, I think that we sh we should have actually open discussion sometimes for three hours. Um, I am uh, going to block you, Ali, because I think that you're trolling. But... Um, I don't tolerate trolling on the channel. I tolerate any question, and I tolerate truth, but I am starting to doubt whether or not you're telling the truth. Yep. I don't know, maybe. I'm not gonna block you, yet. But if this is how every stream is gonna be with you uh, speaking, I will uh, block you. But. Not because I have any problem with you sharing your personal experiences. Just, it's hard for me to know whether or not uh, you're trolling or not. So, bring it down the hammer. Yeah, like, uh, you gotta bring down the hammer sometimes. I, I just want things to be productive. I'll give you second chances too. Like, I believe in, I better believe in second chances. We all need them. Uh, but, uh, like, Try and add to discussion constructively. Anyways, peace out, everybody. I appreciate it, uh, as always. Have a good night, and I will see you tomorrow.